Okay, if you guys see it, so thanks a lot for having me again. And um, let me just start. So yes, I indeed want to talk about large language models in economics. And let me see if um, this works a little bit better. And <clears throat> well, first of all, uh, let me point out that uh, these slides are available at this uh, web address. And I will, in fact, uh, periodically update them. Um, it is a fact that um, large language models is a very, very um, active area of research right now. And probably in just a few months, I will, feel, I will find that um, I need to uh, change a little bit what I uh, do. Oops. And let me get out of and because I actually want to show you a couple of things. Nonetheless, some of you may want to have a little bit more additional material. So if you want to uh, have a little bit more background on artificial intelligence and deep learning, you click over here on this link and you can go to my web page. This is my teaching. And you will see that I have a course called Machine Learning for Macroeconomics. It's really machine learning in general. So if you click on the accordion button, you will see that I have a long list of lectures and you may get a little bit additional background on some of the stuff. And also last year, I gave also another uh, class here at the Macro Finance Society. Uh, it is in YouTube and you, and you can check again a little bit more of the material on the background on uh, deep learning. Uh, let me point out, um, if I have time, I may show you some examples. I'm going to use them with uh, Python and, Py I, and PyTorch, but don't worry, uh, you can follow the arguments of the class without any knowledge of Python and PyTorch. However, if you are interested in undertaking research on large language models, it is likely the case that in some moment you want to learn some of the basic ideas of Python and PyTorch. Uh, throughout the lecture, I'm going to have many references some of them you will see that there are actually videos online or even a blog post. This is an area, as I was mentioning before, that is very quickly evolving. And in fact, there is no such a thing as a good textbook on the material, but let me know if you want a specific references. If for whatever the reason you are interested in a very concrete point and you don't see it in the, in the slides, feel free to send me an email. It's very easy to find my email address on my webpage and I will be happy to provide you with further information. And last but not least, let me thank many of my co-authors and students. And let me point out that um, a few of the slides are actually taken directly from some of the stuff uh, they have done, okay? So let me tell you a little bit what the plan today is. Of course, a complete treatment of large language models and their applications in economics will deserve a whole semester of lecturing. And today, since I only have three hours, I will need to concentrate on a few key ideas. In particular, I aim to accomplish that by the end of this lecture, you have an understanding of what a large language model is, what transduction is, what embedding is, and what attention is. So these are the four main ideas of this lecture. Mm -hmm. So if I could give you a test at the end at 12 o'clock, um, those will be the four questions that will show up in the test for sure. Can you define a large language model? Can you briefly explain what transduction is? Can you tell me why embedding is the key of why everything works? And can you tell me what attention is? Now, the way I'm going to uh, um, think about uh, the way this goes is I have divided the presentation in five parts. I will go from the more general to the more technical. First, I will tell you a little bit about the revolution of large language models and why this has happened now. Second, I will tell you a little bit about the role of large language models in economics, and I will provide you some early examples of papers that during the last year have tried to apply these large language models in economics. Then I will make a more general introduction of text as data. I will then move 
to give you a brief overview of what natural language processing is about. And finally, we will spend some time into the details of the transformer model. As you will see momentarily, everything really depends on the transformer model. And that's the part of the presentation that will be probably the most technical. But if you really want to understand what is going on, I will encourage you to try to go through those details. So my idea is to try to cover points one to four during the first half of the presentation, and then cover point five during the second half. Very good. So let me then uh, introduce the idea of what a large language model is and the revolution of what has happened over the last year or so. So um, ChatGPT, which is nothing more than a chatbot, and I will define what the chatbot is in a second, built on top of the GPT large language model was released on November 28, 2022. And people who were interested in artificial intelligence had been following the progress of GPT for a while. I have even pre-registered for its release, but uh, how surprisingly good ChatGPT was really popularized deep learning models trained with a text corpus. Overnight, everyone is starting talking about large language models. And then the first question that we need to ask ourselves is what is a large language model? Well, first of all, let me tell you what a language model is. So a language model is nothing more than a statistical model that tries to learn a probability distribution over language. So we are going to have some words Actually, they are going to be something called tokens, but I will define them later a little bit more um, carefully. So we are going to have a distribution over a vocabulary of possible words. So let's suppose we have a total of M possible words. And what we are looking is for a probability of how those words are distributed in a text. So for instance, imagine that I ask you, okay, I have an article in the Financial Times and I have the following two words, and they come one after the other, European central. And what the la large language, the language model is going to try to figure it out is what is the most likely word after European central. And of course, what we hope is that the answer will be bank, because as anyone will very easily check if you read the Financial Times, after European and Central, and every, every single time, what you find is the word bank. And language models are going to build these probability structures in different ways, and they are not necessarily based on deep neural networks, although the deep neural network behind the transformer model that I'm going to explain has gained much popularity, and that's the reason why GPT works. Okay. But at a very fundamental level, it's very easy and very straightforward to understand what a language model is. It's just a probability distribution over words. Why do we call them large? Well, they are large because they have a gigantic amount of training data and a gigantic amount of parameters. So in terms of training data, uh, large language models use basically three sources of information, common crawl, Wikipedia, and GitHub. So for instance, this is the training data, the amount of text that we get to tell the model how these probability distributions come from LAMA. LAMA is one large language model that is open source and that I will introduce momentarily. Common crawl is a nonprofit organization that crawls the internet that its name indicates and incorporates a lot of text into easily accessible data files. And you can see that 67% of, uh, sorry, over here that this size common crawl is 3.3 terabytes of data. This is really a homongous amount of data. It's a tremendous amount of data. And not only that, we are going to use, or LAMA uses 67% of this total amount of um, of, of the this size to get uh, the training. But the second point that makes these models large is the amount of parameters that they have. So Palm, which is a Google model, has 540 billion parameters, and GPT-4 
even if it is not completely public and we are not 100% sure about its details, is rumored to have 1 trillion parameters. And I want to emphasize that. We are going to face the problem that we need to solve an optimization problem, which is going to get the best possible parameters for this distribution that is going to have 1 trillion parameters to optimize. So often in economics, we have talks where people come and say, oh, my optimization problem is very difficult because I have 20 parameters to optimize. I need to maximize my likelihood function over 20 parameters. Well, our colleagues in artificial intelligence are solving these days problems where they need to optimize over 1 trillion parameters. And that kind of puts things in perspective. In fact, in the slides, I have some graphs from a paper by Sevilla and co-authors where they show the enormous increase in the complexity of these models over time. And in the vertical axis, we have the floating operations that is kind of a measure of computational complexity of models in artificial intelligence. And you can see how there was a big increase around 2010, which was the beginning of the so-called deep learning era. And actually, I will explain to you later why that happened. And then around 2016, when we started with the large scale area. And you can see these are log scales in exponentials. And you can see this enormous increase in a speed, uh, sorry, in computational complexity. And in fact, the change in the trends. And if you focus just over the last 13 years, you will see models over here where you have a number of e to the power of 24 uh, flops that you need to compute. And I don't know how many of you have flops in their head as uh, computational complexity, but this is a really an incredible amount of computational power. And you will see in particular why this computational power has come around. Okay, so this is what we mean by a large language model. A language model is just a probability distribution over words. We are going to try to figure it out what comes after European Central, which word comes after European Central. And we are going to use homongous amount of training data and an incredible number of parameters. Okay, so um, uh, again, uh, I think that now is a, it's a good moment to think a little bit about um, why this has happened now, okay? And the key paper that started it all is a paper by Elman, which is a cognitive scientist at the University of California, San Diego. You have his photograph over here. And he brought an enormously influential paper called Finding a Structure in Time. And I call this a slide, location, 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 kind of the standard argument in real estate, because Elman highlighted that the key point is to try to exploit the location of words within a text, okay? That over here, this is a figure two that comes directly from Elman's original paper. And what you are going to have is a word like bank, you know, again, coming back to my example of the European Central Bank. And what you are going to have is some context units. And the context units, of course, are going to be things like European, Central, and maybe later on after bank interest rate. And that somehow we are going to try to put together bank, we are going to try to put together European central interest rate, and we are going to transform all of this through a neural network, and that will give you the output that we are going to need. Okay. So basically, Elman's point was what really matters is the context. We need to look not only at words in isolation, but words in the context in which they appear. Well, everyone thought, wow, this idea seems very nice, but how do we implement it in practice? If you go and read the 1990 paper by Elman, there is a lot of concept conceptual understanding. There is a lot of breakthroughs in terms of abstract thinking, but there was not a lot of practical information about how to do this. And what is going to change everything in practice is the conjunction of three ideas. The first, is going to be a path-breaking algorithm revolution. And that's going to be the arrival of the transformer model. OK, so the transformer model is not uh, like that silly TV series of cartoon that maybe some of you watched when you were kids. It's a model that is going to transform words in a very particular way. 
and is based on self-attention. And what I want to emphasize is that this was December 2017. Okay, in particular is this paper. Attention is all you need by Baswani and his co-authors. This is the paper that changes absolutely everything. And this paper circulated, uh, it was not published, eh? it circulated in December 2017. Yeah. So we are really talking about something that in some sense is not even six years old. But the transformer model was such an enormous advance that it has allowed the arrival of GPT. The second thing is the arrival of GPUs. So GPUs basically what they allow is the graphic processing units is that we are going to be able to implement the transformer model in a massive parallel way. I will explain later in the second half of this presentation that these models be, uh, work because they have something called attention multi-heads. And it turns out to be the case that an attention multi-head is something that is perfect to run on separate GPUs opens, okay? So GPUs are great to parallelize for a very particular class of algorithms. It happens to be the case that the transformer is perfect for GPUs. So these two are really the absolute uh, things that go together. And that's probably why some of you, since you are in macro finance, may have seen a chart like this. This is the stock price, the share price of NVIDIA. NVIDIA is the corporation that is the main producer of GPUs in the world. They produce the best and the fastest GPUs. And you can see how in 2020, it was trading at around $60 per share. And then early in 2020, people start realizing this revolution of the multi-head algorithm and that that's going to completely change the demand for GPUs. And you can start seeing how the price of NVIDIA goes up, goes up. Of course, you know, there was a little bit of a tank in the market of financial of uh, the IT companies. But by now, when I make this screenshot, it was trading at 454. So had you been paying attention over here <laughs> to attention, to the fact that attention was changing everything, you will have had a nice, uh, multiplication of your investment in NVIDIA by a factor of eight. Also, maybe this is a little bit less relevant, but we have learned that the best way to train large language models is to increase at the same time the amount of complexity in the number of parameters that we have and the data. You don't want to just increase complexity or you just don't want to increase data. You want both of them to grow at the same rate. And in particular, there is this very influential paper by Hoffman and his co-authors training compute optimal large language models that makes this point. So suddenly we have learned a lot about how to compute these models since December 2017. And the way we have learned this is to do it through GPUs and through a transformer model. And that's why in GPT, so GPT has three letters, G, P, and T. And I'm going to tell you all three of them. Well, the first one is the T because it's a transformer. So GPT is a generative pre-trained transformer. You already know why this is called a transformer because we are going to use the transformer model and we are going to learn later on what a transformer model is. Okay. So there are three types of um, large language models. They are the generic ones. The generic ones are focused on predicting the next token. So in my example before, I have European Central and what you need to do is focus on which will be the next most likely token, which, you know, as you can imagine in this case, is going to be bank. I'm going to center my presentation today on this type. There are other types of large language models, which are instruction tune. Those are models where you will maybe take a generic language model and then fine tune it to try to, um, uh, for instance, accomplish some type of particular instruction. For instance, if you say something like write an essay about the importance of market power in industrial organization, and you also have dialogue tune, which is in fact what ChatGPT is, because uh, you basically try to have a nice interface that will communicate 
with the user in a little bit of an easy way. The base model, the generic language models tend to be a little bit harder to interact with. Since at the end of the day, these are just the two and three are just fine tunings of number one, I'm going to concentrate on number one and just say a couple of things about two and three. Mm -hmm. so what, can I ask yeah. you a very quick question? Of course. Uh, it's uh, very basic. If, if all it's doing is predicting the next token, yeah. then how come it often produces like structure, it can it can draft, you know, an itemized list with like with many items and have, uh, you know, a structured letter or or anything like that. It it seems like it's doing more than just the next word. Is that just an illusion or is there? Yeah, it's just it's just totally, it? it's just totally an illusion, and it's totally the fact of what the transformer is going to do. The transformer is going to really be able to embody this idea of context. And remember, for the, from the perspective of the transformer, the words are really tokens. And that's why I was trying to be a little bit careful about that before. And for instance, an itemized list, one or item one or item two, just the, the number two for item is just another token. And it's going to be able to predict extremely well that what you want in a list is that the next token is a two because you are starting the new item of the list. But the key, you are absolutely right, Alexi, the key is the context. And when I get into the details, hopefully this will be clear. And if not, ask me this question again, okay? But it's, everything is about the context. Everything is Elman idea that what matters is the context. And that's why it's going to be able to produce something that looks like it has real structure, okay? Any other question? Okay, very good. So uh, what type of things we can accomplish through the large language model? Well, basically anything that is to tackle text-based tasks. So for instance, text classification, we have an article in the Financial Times and we want to classify whether this article is about finance or is this about politics. Text summarization, and I will show you examples later on of how people is already using these ideas in finance to summarize corporate reports, which are particularly verbose and long, including sentiment analysis. We want to figure it out if people is happy or unhappy about a product or about an asset. Text generation, this is exactly the question that Alexi was asking, how can we generate a text that really looks like it has a human structure and an understanding of what is going on. And this includes both translation and coding. Some of you may have already figured it out that ChatGPT is surprisingly good. If you ask things like, can you give me an example of how to write a loop in Python? It will actually do it very well. Questions and answers. You can ask ChatGPT, can you tell me uh, you know, where the capital of, of France is? And also these days, more and more common sense and reasoning, where you actually set up a prompt of a circumstance like what you will get in SAT on, in the GRE when they have the analytic part, and ChatGPT can actually work through that and figure it out the right answer. Because of these capabilities, in particular, the ability to generate new text the ability to provide answers that are properly structured and this common sense reasoning, we call a large language model a part of generative artificial intelligence. And generative means in this particular context is that there are models capable of generate new content. And that's why we have the G in GPT. Remember, we have the transformer before, now we have the word generative. So this is a transformer that is able to generate new content. Jesus, I have a question yeah. from the chat. Uh, Ferdinando, do you want to go ahead and ask it? Are you there? All right, never mind, I'll ask it myself. So Ferdinando is asking whether describing a large language models as stochastic parrots, whether that's a good way of putting it. Yeah, so some people have used that expression in a little bit of a negative way um, because they try to say that models, um, large language models do not have any type of understanding of what is going on. 
And um, I would say I agree with that statement by 75%. I actually have a slide where I'm going to come back to that point because large language models seem to have a theory of the mind. And I will explain that in a second. So I'm not be, uh, within the group that thinks that we are quite close to general artificial intelligence. I actually think we are quite far away, but I also don't want to call large language models just a stochastic parrots. I think there is a little bit more behind that. But I actually have a slide on that, like three or four slides from now on. Very, very good. In fact, that's exactly what I wanted to say. Because of this ability to um, generate new content, some authors are even talking about foundation models. Okay, so And this is one of the most important ideas over the last couple of years in artificial intelligence. So the traditional way in which we have built models in artificial intelligence is we will have a model for translation. We will have another model for image recognition. We will have another model for image generation. Well, it turns out to be the case that the transformer is sufficiently general of an approach that it can handle everything at the same time. This is a graph that I'm taking from a textbook. And it says, look, it doesn't matter. You can take text, you can take images, you can take a speech, you can take a structured data, you can take video. You will put it in the foundation model and the foundation model will be able to generate all these type of different answer, uh, different tasks from question uh, answering, sentiment, information extraction, all the way to video creation. And the point over here is embedding. So remember I told you before that the most important or one of the four more important ideas I wanted to tell you today was embedding. So what is embedding? Embedding is the following idea. I'm going to take an object. And that object can be anything. It can be a word. It can be an image. It can be a video, you name it, okay? And I'm going to take that object and I'm going to put it in an embedding model. And an embedding model is just a very sophisticated way to denote a gigantic matrix. So the word, I'm going to transform it, for instance, into some zeros and ones. An image is just going to be zeros and ones because there are pixels. And the same for a video, it's just zeros and ones because they are just pixels. I'm going to put it in an embedding model, which is just one gigantic matrix. And we will need to decide how we pick that gigantic matrix. And it will spin out vectors and will be vectors of very, very high dimensions. So for every word, I will have an embedding vector associated to it. For every image, I will have an embedding vector associated to it. For every video, I will have an embedding vector associated to it. And these vectors, are just going to be vectors and I'm going to be able to manipulate them. And I'm going to be able to define a standard set of operations of these vectors. And then I'm going to apply the matrix in the other direction. And I will get some output, which is a new word, a new image, a new video. And at the end of the day, the idea of foundation models is that it doesn't matter if the object one, object two, or object three is any of these ideas over here, a text, a dialogue, or a video, because everything through embedding becomes an embedding vector. And then I can do with them everything I want. And at, I know at this moment, this is a little bit abstract, but when later we go over the transformer and I actually get into the details of the transformer, you will see this very clear. I actually have code to show you about how embedding is done with Python, okay? But what you want to keep in mind at this moment at a very general level is that this idea of a general foundation model is that everything, all types of information in the real world can be always transformed into vectors. And once I have vectors, I can manipulate them with linear algebra in a standard ways. Now, that will also- uh, require, Another yeah. question from, from the chat. If yes. maybe you can comment on the relationship between large language models and deep learning. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so large language model, we are going to have this metrics that I was mentioning before. And the issue is how do we find this W, these gigantic metrics? Well, we are going to get this W through a neural network. Okay. And that's why these things work so well, because otherwise, how do I come up with this embedding matrix? How do I come up with this W? Uh, you know, theoretically it exists, but how in the world I determine it? Well, the way I'm going to do it is through a deep neural network. And that's why at the beginning of the talk, I was giving you some links and videos on neural networks. Later on, again, when I get into the details of how the transformer model works, you will see exactly where the neural network is, but just in case that anyone is getting a little bit nervous, let me jump ahead a little bit. And let me see if I have the graph over here, but I want to have it over here, a little bit ahead in the slides. Okay, we are going to we are going to build that metric. That matrix is going to be over here in this architecture, and over here, that's where we are going to have the neural network, and that's what is going to link these language models with deep neural networks. Now, having said that, theoretically, you could build a large language model without a deep neural network. Okay, you could do it through other methods. I don't think that in practice is going to be feasible, but you need to keep in mind those are two different things. Okay, so you have the large language model, which is a stochastic statistical model of how words come together, or if you think about foundation models in general, how any type of data cluster together through an embedding vector. And neural networks is how you compute that embedding or how you actually get the embedding in practice. Any other question at this moment? Very good. Now, coming back to the question I got before about large language model as a stochastic parrots. Well, it turns out to be the case that this idea of the foundation model is very intriguing because the models seem to have properties that we don't fully understand. And those are called emerging properties. For instance, large language models seem to have a theory of the mind. So let me tell you what I mean by that with a very famous example. So Mary arrives home. Okay, so this <laughs> little cartoon is Mary. And there is a box. And the box says in big letters, chocolate. But the box is full of popcorn, not of chocolate. So we describe this situation to ChatGPT. And we ask ChatGPT, ChatGPT, what do you think Mary believes is inside the box? And surprisingly enough, ChatGPT answers chocolates. ChatGPT understands that what Mary sees is a box that is full and it says chocolates in a label and that the extra information which is inside the chocolate box there, there is popcorn and not chocolate, it should drop that information and just focus on the label. And that's called a theory of the mind. So the theory of the mind in cognitive psychology and neuroscience refers to the ability that humans have. Children usually develop their theory of the mind between three to six years old to understand what is in the brains of other people. And ChatGPT seems to understand, given the information that we are given it, that Mary believes there is chocolate and not popcorn. And that's why I was saying before, I not fully agree or I don't fully agree with the idea of large language models to be mere stochastic parrots which are just repeating information. They seem to have some concept of understanding. Of course, this depends on how we define understanding. And again, this is part of the conversation we could have and why I could have a whole semester talking about these things. But this is very interesting 
because this idea that through this very simple embedding, you can get emerging properties that replicate understanding or that look like understanding were already pointed out by an economist, which is F.A. Hayek. And not a lot of people know it, but F.A. Hayek was very interested in psychology and he wrote a very interesting book called The Sensory Order. And in that sensory order, he already talked about this idea of neural networks and how a neural network could have emerging properties, including a theory of the mind. Okay, so I don't know, it's kind of interesting that economists have been thinking in some sense about this issue for many decades. Of it's, course, it's, uh, uh, yep. is it, isn't it ironic that what you're kind of saying is some notion of ChatGPT understanding has to do with these emerging properties, which is our own inability to understand what it's doing. It, it, exactly. It, and defining the ability of it to understand based yeah. on our inability to understand it. Exactly. It's a little ironic. I don't know how to think about it. I know, it. I know. In fact, I have a slide later on, <laughs> and I'm going to tell you why large language models, I think I have it over here, have completely destroyed the research agenda of the universal formal grammar. I, I will come back to that in a second. No, no, the, 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 the implications of this for things like metaphysics and the theory of language and the philosophy of language are quite amazing. And it's precisely because they, we seem to have emerging properties, large language models seem to be able to go through these reasonings. And again, if you ask, if you put the setup that I told you about Mary and the chocolate box, it's only when you are around four to five years old that kids start giving you the right answer. And yet, large, uh, and yet ChatGPT seems to keep the, the right answer to a lot of these questions. That's actually quite amazing. And then the question is, you know, how far away we are from artificial general intelligence, where general here means your ability to reason through all sorts of situations and not just on a very reduced set of tasks. And of course, that links a lot with um, questions related with what is uh, intelligence. Now, I don't have the time. I would love to talk about these issues. <laughs> uh, if anyone knows me, uh, you know that I'm very interested in philosophy. I have been thinking about these issues. Uh, I'm, I'm not kidding, since I was 14 years old, so I can't really talk about this for eight years. But this links, of course, with many other debates about, you know, these models sometimes hallucinate. And the reason they hallucinate is very simple, is they are trying to forecast the next word. And if the next word kind of fits together with the previous two words, then the following word will also fit and they will be able to come up with a story or with a text that makes sense within the context of the text, but doesn't have any relation with reality. And it's just because they keep forecasting. And this is kind of a self-fulfilling equilibrium, if you know what I'm talking about in game theory, that it kind of makes sense within the context of the model. And of course, this also links with issues like existential risk and so on. I link over there to a very interesting debate in MOOC uh, between people who think that existential risk is an important issue, people who think it's not an important issue. Uh, you can check the video, it's very nice. But again, in the interest of time, since I really want to focus on economics, let me not spend much time over there. But if you want to learn more about foundation models and the possibilities and challenges of foundation models, the Center for Research on Foundation Models at Stanford has this long working paper. It's over 200 pages. So you could think this is really a small book on the opportunities and risk of foundation models. And you will uh, you know, recognize even some famous economists like Eric over here, who has been thinking a lot about this type of issues for a while. Okay, so that's a little bit of um, kind of you know, abstract uh, considerations let's get down to more concrete details and how this applies to economics. So there are two types. Let me, let me pose you with, with another question we have from, from the chat. Um, Manuel, do, do you wanna ask it yourself? Oh, sure. So my question is that if this LM, L, LLMs can consider time filtrations when you use time series data, Okay, so that is exactly what I'm trying to tell you. Um, the, the base models are general purpose. And in that sense, they are not really designed 
to accomplish a specific task, such as uh, determine some structure in time series or some filtration in time series. Now, theoretically, and I'm going to come back to that a little bit later over here in bullet point four, where you could do some type of fine tuning or supervised learning and add them on top of the basic model and a large language model like that will be able to handle also time series. And I'm going to, I'm going to come back to that again in, in just a couple of slides, okay? Thank you. But, but the point is, you know, but that's a great question because it really helps me with the general point I was going to make mm -hmm. that you can either have a general purpose large language model. And the idea over there is that you pre-train the large language model on a very, very large data set. So as I was mentioning before, you take crawl, you take GitHub, you take Wikipedia, throw that to the large language model and pre-train it. Which just means, remember, you have all those one trillion parameters, you select these one trillion parameters. And that pre-train is the last letter in our GPT. So now, Next time you are with friends, you can amaze them by your understanding of the three letters in GPT, because this is a generative pre-trained transformer. It's a transformer model, which basically looks at context of the words through the mechanism of attention that is able to generate new text, and it has been pre-trained on a large data set. Okay, so that's why we call this a GPT. And what then you can do is you can say, well, let me take the pre-trained model and apply it to a smaller data set, to a smaller, this is, I will introduce this notation later on, to a smaller corpus. For instance, what you can say is, let me take my large language model and fine tune the parameters with all the documents within the FED. So imagine that I have access to the whole archives of the FED, I could fine tune the model to understand or to replicate the archives of the FED. Or I could do that with every single MBA working paper or with all articles in the Financial Times. And what OpenAI has been very good at, that's really their comparative advantage with respect to other people in the industry, is that they have been very good at that fine tuning. In particular, they have very parameter efficient ways to fine tune. Remember, we are going to have that gigantic embedding matrix that is going to be a gigantic neural network. Well, they are very good at fine tune the weights in this gigantic neural network in ways that are not too computationally intensive. I say not too much because it's computationally intensive, but not incredibly computationally intensive. Prompt training, which is understanding. So the performance of large language models is going to depend dramatically on what you ask them. And the small ways in which you change what you ask gives big differences in the outcome. So really understanding, and that comes back to Alexei's point before about we need to, since we don't really fully understand the model, we don't really fully understand what is the best way to ask it. So we need to still thinking about how we ask the model and also supervise learning. So one of the things that makes ChatGPT so expensive to develop is that we are also going to have some human input in the training. And I will tell you a little bit later exactly how that looks. But at the end of the day, the whole idea of why you can do this specialized large language model without too much effort. In fact, you can even have a set of shoot learning. And I'm going to tell you in a second what that thing is, is because of the idea of transduction. So let me tell you what zero or few shot learning is, okay? So that actually is the paper, the academic, the academic paper that presented ChatGPT to researchers is called La Language Models are Few Shot Learners by Brown and co-authors. And the idea over there is that I have a general model and then I want to specialize it. How many shots of learning I need? By shot here, you think about how many iterates I need of extra learning. And what these guys argue is that lang large language models are very, very few shot learners. It means you need to retrain them very little. So if I have my chat GPT or my GPT-3 or, or GPT-4 pre-trained on a large data set, 
then retraining it, fine tuning it to incorporate all the MBR working papers, which is a very, very specialized set of information actually requires very few iterations. And that's really what has changed the minds of a lot of people within academia, within the computer science and artificial intelligence community about the potential importance of these models for research. And as I was mentioning before, the key idea here is the idea of transduction. transduction. So what the heck is transduction? Well, some of, I imagine that most of you learned about induction when you were in high school or maybe in college. And over there, you learn about induction means you go from the particular to the general and from the general to the particular. So let me give you an idea. You see a lot of cows. Okay, so this is supposed to be a cow, not a very good one, but anyway. You see a lot of cows and then you get the following idea. A cow is an animal with four legs, two horns, a tail, okay? And it's a mammal, let's suppose. And then you see a new photograph of an animal and you ask yourself, does this animal satisfy this condition, okay? So we have a bunch of photographs of cows. We learn what a cow is in a set of general rules and then we apply those rules to a particular situation. What we are going to do with large language models is transduction, which is just the particular with a particular. We are going to have a photograph of a cow and another photograph of a cow. And we are going to ask, are these two photographs close enough or not? Or in the, in the case of words is European central. And I have seen a lot of text where the next word after European central is bank. So I'm just going to copy it. I'm not going to look in any way, shape or form for any type of general rule. This is going to be <coughs> imitation. And that's why some of the critics of large language models of people who are a little bit less excited about large language models call them in the expression we already referred before as stochastic parrots. They just repeat, so they imitate. Now, the idea or, or the reason to me why this is a little bit maybe a negative characterization is because there is actually a very well developed theory of transduction by one of the persons who I think is one of the most insightful researchers in computer science of statistics of the last 50 years, which surprisingly enough is not sufficiently appreciated, which is Vladimir Vafnik, and this is his photograph on the nature of statistical learning theory. And Vafnik develop a whole theory, a whole mathematical theory of transduction that says, no, no, there is actually something very deep and very fundamental about learning that goes beyond this characterization as an stochastic parrot. And also this is related to the failure of the project of building a universal formal grammar in the 1970s. I will come back to that later on, but what linguistics was during the 1960s and in particular during the 1970s was the idea of saying, look, let's come up with the general rules of the language. Those general rules of the language are actually going to hold for every single human language there is. And then we are going to apply those particular, those general rules to particular situations. What ChatGPT has shown and large language models have shown is that that's not the case that we can build models that write very coherent text that have sense that you give it to another human and the human will recognize it as texts that are very well written and very coherent mm -hmm. without any idea of coming up with general rules. Yes? So it's so mitten in so a lecture. Say that again? Yeah, it off for two minutes. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, any question at this moment? Very good. So um, how will you interact with, a, with an, um, a large language models? I'm pretty sure that most of you have probably already used a chat GPT and you will do it through a chatbot. So a chatbot is just a dialogue uh, window. It's just basically where you enter, you put some ideas and uh, uh, sorry, some text and you get some output. That's a chatbot and that's why we have chat GPT. So that 
now you understand the whole concept of ChatGPT, which is a chatbot for generative pre-trained transformer. However, in research, most likely you are not going to be being using, unless it's a very simple task, the chatbot. You are going to be trying to use some type of application programming interface. Okay, so imagine that what you want to do is you want to use a large language model to go over hundreds and hundreds of articles or over thousands and thousands of corporate reports. Of course, you cannot do this through the chatbot, but you will need to look is at the API. Okay, this is a screenshot of how this will look like. So this will be in Python and you will import the package, the library to interact with ChatGPT, and you will have instructions in this way. Obviously, given the time I have, I cannot really go after the API. In addition to it, it's kind of a pure simple syntax that is not particularly deep or very something that one needs to spend a lot of a heck of time. Let me recommend, if you want to learn the API for GPT-3, and this following book by Sandra Kublik and Subham Sabu, and also just go to OpenAI, and they have a very detailed documentation about the application program interface. And if you know a little bit of Python, you will also learn how to interact with it in quite a straightforward way. The last thing I want to tell you about this very general introduction to large language models is that there is life beyond ChatGPT, okay? Yes, ChatGPT is the one that we all know, that we have all used, and that you know has dominated the imagination and the articles in the popular press, but there are many other things out there. In particular, the best open source model is called Llama, okay? Is done by your friends at Meta, the old Facebook, and you can find it over there, Llama 2, open source, free for research and commercial use. And Llama will look a lot, I have over here open, um, there's a bunch of things over there. I have open here the chatbot, and you know, the chatbot will look a lot like the one from what is the capital of Spain. like the one from ChatGPT. Okay, an error, of course, because the, the connection has, um, um, has um, okay, uh, lost, but anyway, I, I can come back to that later. But the very good thing about Llama 2 is that it's open source. And this may be particularly important if you are working in a situation where for whatever the reason, you don't want to use a commercial software or a software that is closed. Recently, I was at the European Central Bank and they were concerned about using ChatGPT with their internal documents in case that ChatGPT will transmit some type of privileged information. And I told them, well, think about something like Llama 2, and the good idea about Llama 2 is open source. You can install it in your own local server. It's open source, so you can check that it's not transmitting any type of information. But most importantly, it's a local installation. It's not going to violate any condition of safety, security, or copyrights. And, and there is a few places. There is uh, this very nice hugging face. It's kind of the main community for uh, open artificial intelligence in general and you will have a lot of information over there about what are the best uh, models at this moment. So for instance, over there, you see that one fine-tuned versions of Llama is the best in terms of the performance, although it's still the case that for pure um, chat conversation, GPT-4, which is the close um, uh, version of chat of, of GPT, which we don't really have access to it as researchers, has, has the best. But the point I'm trying to say is large language models is a very wide family. There is a lot of people working out there in that space. GPT may be good for your needs, but maybe other models like Llama or Bart from Google may be helpful for you. Okay, so this is kind of a brief introduction to large language models. Let me stop over here to ask for questions before we get onto the role of large lang language models in economics. Any question? Okay, so very good. So now some of you may be asking, okay, that's that's good. I learned what, the, what ChatGPT means. I learned 
the rough idea of what a large language model is, how can I apply this in my day-to-day -day work? And what I'm going to say is, well, let me do it in three different levels. First, how can large language models change my workflow, okay? And I'm going to point out five sources of information. The first one is two texts, two um, articles, text as data by Genso, Kelly, and Taddy, and text algorithms in economics by us and, uh, us and Hansen. Those are very two nice general introductory surveys for the idea of text in general as a way to extract information from the real world. This one came out in the Journal of Economic Perspective, I think 2018. It's a very nice survey, don't get me wrong in any way. The fact that it's five years old <laughs> and this has changed so much, maybe has made some of the ideas over there a little bit uh, out of fashion, but it's a still a very nice kind of big overview of what to do. Ash and Hansen is much more updated with some of the new ideas about large language models so I will recommend you to take a look at it. Ryan has this, a user guide to GPT and large language models for economic research. And it's just examples of how to use large language models in your daily research. It's a very short text. I think it's like maybe six or seven pages, but he outlines ways to interact with large language models. As I was mentioning before, something that is absolutely fundamental about these large language models is that they really, really depend on the prompt. It really, for the large language model to work well, we need to ask the right question. And what um, Ryan does is to show you how to ask the right questions. Also, Karpathy, Karpathy is one of the top engineers at uh, artificial and open AI. He has great videos, by the way. If you put his name, is Andrew Karpathy on a YouTube. He has fantastic videos. He's a great lecturer. And in the second half of this video, you can click over there. So it's like a 45 minutes video. Go after minute 20 or so. He will have a lot of very nice tricks for good prompting, okay? So to ask the right questions, he will tell you, he will give you kind of a lot of suggestions about how to do it. And since he's very deeply involved in the coding of GPT, of course, he has uh, some good ideas. And a little bit more in detail, Corinek at Virginia has this nice paper, Language Models and Cognitive Automation for Economic Research, where he also uh, has some points about LLMs for idea creation, writing, background research, data analysis, coding, and mathematical derivations, okay? So these five references are a little bit about, hey, I want to incorporate a little bit of large language models into my workflow, how do I do it? The next slide is about, okay, fine. I want to be even more ambitious. I want to think about how can I apply large language models to learn about the economy? So for instance, Pat Bayari at Amazon and his co-authors has this very nice paper, Edonic Prices and Quality Adjusted Price Indexes Powered by Artificial Intelligence, where they use product description tags to predict product prices. So the idea is a lot of products, you don't have quantitative numbers associated with it, but you have text. You say, oh, this is a very silky shirt. And you can use that information to predict prices. Uh, Kim, Moon, and Nikolai from Chicago basically use large language models to summarize complex corporate disclosures and using the stock market test that in fact there is information over there. That's a very nice paper. I think it really shows that, you know, ChatGPT and other large language models can help us summarizing tons of information that is in the data out there and that is difficult to summarize otherwise because it will just take us too much time a small army of research assistants to do it. There is a recent paper by Gabe, Koyin, and Yogo, Asset Embeddings, where they apply this idea of embedding I was describing before uh, to try to think about how people allocate their portfolios. And you can think again about 
the structure of a portfolio as just another piece of information that can be transformed into a vector and that has the right properties through embedding. Uh, word to back using language models to understand which premia by ASIC Fana, she looks at the premia associated with eight in demand certification. So things like you are certified to be a network manager. And over there, the problem is you need to figure it out out of the wage that has been posted in the job advertisement, how much is a compensation for the fact that that position is in San Francisco, which is an expensive city to live, and how much of that compensation is attributed to the fact that you actually have the right certification. And that's why using embeddings, this is a very simple word to back, this actually doesn't use deep neural networks, it's a very simple logistic regression. It's an example of a language model that does not rely uh, does not depend on having neural networks, but she actually gets very interesting results about these things. And um, out of one, many using language models to simulate human samples. This is super interesting. And this is an idea that I think has a lot of potential in economics applied more in general by Argyle and co-authors. And what this team does is they say, well, what these models do very, very well is to replicate data. As I was saying before, to imitate using the words that we already discussed as an stochastic parrot. So imagine, for instance, that I have 1,000 subjects in my sample, and I only have two or three that satisfy some properties. So imagine, for instance, that I'm looking, I'm interested in the behavior of a minority who happens to be of a very particular income bracket and a very particular age group. Well, I may only have a couple of persons in the data sample. But I cannot really disclose that information because it will imply that you know there is not anonymity anymore in the survey, or maybe I don't have enough of them to do a research. And since large language models are very good at replicating data, what you can do is you can synthesize new artificial data that is anonymous by construction because it's not any person, it's kind of an artificial person, and yet, it has the right properties, the right statistical properties to undertake econometrics with it. It's a kind of a very sophisticated form of the bootstrap, if you remember from a second what the bootstrap is about. And finally, uh, a few papers about the possible effects of the large language models on the economy, both positive and negative and, and normative. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time with that, but people have think about large language models as an approximation of bounded rationality agents like Horton. Tyler Cohen has a nice podcast, uh, again, linking these large language models with Hayek and how, you know, if we are really, you know, humans are really some kind of sophisticated large language model in our brains, how that changes our conception of how economies work. And some authors have also looked at the consequences, of course, of these large language models for, um, the workforce for the labor markets. And, you know, there is, uh, if I had a little bit more time, I could go over some of the experiences and uh, some of the evidence that we have gathered. And of course, uh, Darona Femoglu and his many, many different co authors have been thinking a little bit about the consequences of these technologies like artificial intelligence in terms of their impact in many different questions like optimal taxation, optimal redistribution policy, et cetera. So if you are interested then in large language models, just very quickly remind you, you can use them for a lot of things. So personally, for instance, these days for very simple coding tasks, for very simple graphing, uh, very simple text uh, manipulation, I use uh, ChatGPT a lot, but you can also think about using them in a more sophisticated way to ask much more pointed questions. And of course, you can also think about what are the consequences of large language models for the economy and the society at large. So let me stop here for a second and ask for questions. Okay, well, then I continue. Anyway, so um, let me then move a little bit more into details of what we are going to do. And in particular, we are going to start talking about text as data. And you know, at the end of the day, large language models use text as the source of information. And this is not a surprise for economists because we have had 
the suspicion now for a long time that there is a lot of information that goes beyond numbers. So the traditional data sets that I used when I was in graduate school was you go to the local statistical agency and you download a time series for GDP, for inflation, for unemployment. And the problem is that a lot of those data sets, as informative as they are, they have limitations. For instance, we don't have good uh, data or good statistical data about what policymakers can do in the future. And yet, we have all of those in forms of text. So, for instance, we have a statements by policymakers. When central banks change the interest rates, they usually do it together with press releases, detailed explanations, speeches by the governors, and press conferences. And the central banks try their very best at conveying information over there. In fact, one of my co-authors is what he does in a lot of his day-to-day -day work when he's not writing papers with me. He writes speeches for the governor of the Bank of Spain, and he tries to convey information about how the bank sees the situation of the European and the Spanish economy and what the future policy actions are going to be. So in saying it's crazy not to try to use that information. We have political manifestos. When political parties run for election, they state their plans. And actually, political scientists, contrary to a lot of myth, have documented that political parties, once in power, actually implement a lot of the promises they uh, put in their manifestos. Now, another thing is that later we don't tend to like the outcome, but that's a different issue. Political parties actually are relatively good at doing what they promise they are going to do. We have legal documents. So for instance, I have used with Thorsten Drautsburg and Pablo Guerron, we use at court decisions on labor cases as a proxy for shocks to the bargaining power of workers in a model, in a nice bargaining model with shocks to bargaining. We, you can look at criminal records. I already mentioned before the company's earning reports as a source of information, but there are also many others. We have customer complaints, we have documents in libraries and archives, we have news, we have commentary on the news, we have interviews, we have verbal surveys, social media, etc. So the amount of text data that we have over there is quite amazing and we want to use it. And of course the problem is, okay, how are we going to do this? How are we going to be able to use all this text data or even if we go to a foundation model images and many other sources of information because that doesn't look, that text data or the images do not like, like do not look like the you know, nice vectors and matrices that we learn in introduction to statistics and introduction to um, econometrics. So historically, the way this was done was by reading the documents or even interviewing and the authors. I edited a book where we interview all the ministers of finance in Spain over the last 40 years. And, I, and we asked them a lot of questions about why they did what they did. And I think that the book is very interesting and it has a lot of information, but this was very time costly. You need to meet the, the former minister, you need to set up all the questions, you need to process them. And you know, maybe uh, beyond being too slow, this was prone to errors and biases. All of us have uh, possible biases and they are also very hard to replicate. So can we apply some form of basic statistics to this idea? Can we do something that is a little bit more formal. And this whole area of using text as data was pioneered by Mosteller and Wallace in a very important paper in 1963 called Inference in an Authorship Problem. Okay, so this is in some sense the grand grandfather of every large language model. Some of you, if you are from the US, may know that in um, 1787, there is a constitutional convention here in Philadelphia, where I live, and there was a proposal of a constitution. And the problem is that constitution needs to be ratified by the 13 states, and the ratification was a very uh, highly debated topic. In states like New York, actually, probably most of the people were against the constitution. So three authors, 
James Madison, one of the main drafters of the Constitution, Alexander Hamilton, of course, of the Hamilton musical fame, and John Jay brought a series of essays called The Federalist Defending the Ratification of the Constitution. The problem was that all three of them signed as Pluvius, a, non, uh, uh, a generic name, not to identify their own authorship, and we don't really know for sure who brought each of the essays. Madison, at the end of his life, left a partial list of the essays, of who was the author of each essay, but we still didn't know some of them. What Mosteller and Wallace realized was that the frequency and which we use words depends on who we are. It changes slightly among different persons. So I actually, when I first learned about this, I actually did it to convince myself, I got five of the papers I have written and I, I, I picked papers, I was the solo co-author, so there was no one else. Mm -hmm. And I pick other solo co-authors from some of my colleagues in macro at Penn. Okay, so for instance, one of my colleagues is Der Kruger. I took a few of Der Kruger solo papers and I put them through one of those statistical analysis toolboxes that look at frequency of words. And I noticed that Dirk and I use words, some words in a very different frequency. And that if you know that, if you know at which word, at which frequency I use certain words, you will be very, it will be very easy for you to figure it out if some abstract paper was written by me or was written by, by Dirk. And you know, that's how by now we are 90.9% .9 sure, 99.9% .9 sure of who wrote each of these says in the Federalist. Of course, this very this idea of very basic statistics, which by the way, is the same way that you use during World War II to break codes by the Germans and the Japanese, is much more general if you can apply machine learning to it. So what type of things you can do with machine learning to extract from the data? And these are kind of more general ideas that the particular examples I showed you before, well, you can basically do three things. You can do measurement. So you can measure things that do not exist in the data directly from the statistical agency. And I'm going to give you an example in one second. You can do prediction. For instance, in the example I was telling you before, if we see a political manifesto saying that we are going to do X if we win the election, then you will say, well, it is likely that X will happen if party Y wins the election, and then causality. We can undertake statements of if, then, and see what will happen under some of the circumstances. And just as an example of how this has been enormously influential and how large language models can generalize ideas that have been around for a while, let me show you this very, very famous graph by the paper on policy uncertainty by Baker, uh, Bloom, and Davis. As you probably know, there is a large field these days in macro and finance and other fields about the importance of uncertainty. I have written quite a few papers on those. And the problem of uncertainty is that we think that uncertainty matters because it changes over time, it's time varying. But on the other hand, how do we measure that? How do we go to the data and measure the variation of uncertainty because this is not something that it tracks. What, what Baker, Bloom, and Davis thought was, look, let's go to newspapers, for instance, in the US, like US Today, Miami Herald, Chicago, Chicago Tribune, et cetera, and look at the scale monthly counts of articles mentioning uncertain or uncertainty with words like regulation of Federal Reserve. And that gives you an index. The idea is that when the press, the media talks a lot about uncertainty, it's because there is probably a lot of uncertainty. And when the media talks very little about uncertainty, it's because probably there is not of a lot of uncertainty out there. And in fact, this is the index they get that has the peaks where we will expect with the Black Monday in 87, the first Gulf War, the Clinton election, the Russian crisis, long-term capital management, 9-11, the second Gulf War, the debt ceiling dispute, and so on and so forth. Now, what is the problem of this? This one hand is very nice, but on the other hand, their ability to incorporate context was very limited because the only thing they could do is look at uncertainty and deficit in the same article. But they cannot really look at the whole context of the text. 
Okay, so this is a fantastic paper. On the other hand, now with large language models, we can measure uncertainty much better because we can really get the same information that they did. And now we can embed a lot of these words within a much richer context and just realize if they are really talking about uncertainty in the sense of deficit, or maybe they are talking about uncertainty in situations that are not really better. Of course, what Baker, Bloom, and Davis did was to do a little bit of a human audit. They selected randomly a subset of articles to check the context using human intelligence. They hired a bunch of research assistants and they actually gave them detailed instructions and they argue that they probably did quite well and that the measurement error is not very large. But thanks to large language models, we can do these things in a much wider and a much more systematic way. And why is this so exciting? Well, this is so exciting because once you have a very good uncertainty index or any other measure that you are able to get from the data, you can really undertake a lot of experiments. So for instance, what they did in their particular case was, uh, and this is a, a paper by Nick Bloom, once he has this uncertainty index, he can run a vector autoregression where in addition to the standard variables in the vector autoregression, you add this index of uncertainty and you can do both prediction for which you don't need a identification assumption. You just use the, um, the VR to do forecasting and you can do causality analysis for which you need an identification assumption. But as long as you are willing to get that identification assumption, what they document is that an increase in the uncertainty leads to a decrease that is persistent and significant in industrial production and in the deployment response and, and in employment. And those are exactly the points I was making over here. You can use the large language model for measurement by extracting information in a much more general way that what these guys did over here to measure things, you can use them for prediction, you can use them for causality. And of course, the point here is you can mix them with other standard methods. You don't want to think about large, large language models in opposition to a vector autoregression or in opposition to a linear projection. You want to think about them as coming together into a coherent set. If you want to learn more about text in general, maybe you want to check on machine learning for text, the book by Charu Agarwal, who works at IBM as a senior research scientist, Machine Learning for Text, second edition, is a very nice and comprehensive book. And applied to economics and social sciences, text as data by Justin Grimmer, Margaret Roberts, and Brandon Stewart. It's a very nice, simple introduction. I like it a lot because in particular, it will have a lot of the details about how to do text analysis that sometimes are not explained uh, in textbooks or in videos. It's kind of how you get your hands dirty on day-to-day -day operation. And also, if you want to see this apply to monetary policy, Cheryl Schnohart Bailey has this very nice book, which I like a lot, Deliberating American Monetary Policy, a textual analysis. She comes from political science, if I recall this correctly, which means that perhaps this book has been a little bit overlooked by people in monetary economics, but I find it a fantastic book and really illustrates how much you can learn about monetary policy of using Texas data. But the point is, how are we going to do this in concrete using our large language models? So one question. Of course. Maybe you can comment a little bit on how what's the trade-off between doing things in a more automated way versus um, more like handpicked by the researcher? Suppose you want to measure uncertainty. Yeah. Um, what's the balance between you deciding which words in the newspaper yeah. convey uncertainty versus letting some sort of automated algorithm decide that for you? No, that, that's a fantastic question. So first, let me give you my general view about it. Is I tend to be very pragmatic on my approach. <laughs> uh, if you look at my papers, I you will see that I have papers that are pure vector autoregressions because I think there are circumstances where a pure vector autoregression is going to tell me what I'm looking for. And there are papers where I do very heavy structural econometrics, uh, where I estimate the parameter values. And my approach has always been that 
different questions require different methods and that I don't like to make the method an end in itself. So in that sense, I will say that at a very general level, I will say it depends on the question you are looking for. Now, having said that, let me now, you know, raise the stakes a little bit more. I tend to believe that large language models are getting so good that in probably 80% of situations, the large language model is going to do better than you as a human. Okay, so it's not going to be always the case, but I think at this moment, my presumption, my default prior is that the large language model has become so good that it's going to probably overcome, even if it has some hallucinations, it's going to overcome your ability to do things because you are too slow and because it's hard to replicate. Okay, now again. This may not be true in all the cases. So for instance, if you are looking at the behavior of one particular governor of a central bank, you may not have a lot of information, but you have interviews with him, you have his diaries, you have his letters, then a close reading by a human may still be superior. But as soon as, if I were going to redo Baker, Bloom, and Davis today, I will do it with a large language model. I will not use their relatively arbitrary peak of words on their own. I think you can do a little bit better. And this is not a criticism at all of the paper. It's a fantastic paper. And given the, given the field where they brought the paper, they did absolutely the best that was at that moment. I just think that as 2023, if I were going to redo this thing, I would probably redo it through a large language model. Yes, because uh, I, I'm going to believe the large language models, remember what I was telling you about context at the very beginning, they are just going to capture context better than humans. That if you are going to come up with a vocabulary of terms, uh, you are going to introduce biases and mistakes. And uh, the large language model is going to be more robust to that. Any other question? We, we have a couple of questions from, yes. from the chat. Uh, Arpit, do you want to go ahead and ask it yourself? Yeah, my question was about reverse author lookup. So can I look up all the identities of my referees um, if I take my reports and you know run them through a similar algorithm? Could I, as a referee author, start running my reports through ChatGPT to avoid these kinds of fingerprints? In general, is referee anonymity dead? Yeah, so <laughs> I, I'm not sure if I should say this online, but yes, a couple of, you know, maybe three years ago, I was very curious about there is a person who was writing on the internet. Um, this person, for some reason, didn't want to say uh, their name. Let me use the, the gender neutral uh, pronoun. And I was very curious about who this person was. And I just extracted a bunch of uh, texts from the internet. I got a few uh, papers by some of the people who I thought were the likely candidates. And there was a very, very good match uh, for one of them. Uh, now. I'm not going to dox this person in public, but to me, it was very obvious who this person was. And it's the same for referee reports. I think that at this moment, um, it's relatively easy if you get a referee report and you have a sufficient good data set uh, to identify. Now, the only thing that uh, will protect the identity of referees is one, that a lot of my papers are written with many co-authors. And yes, you can check this out. You download 10 of my papers, run these statistical tools through them, and you will see that the frequency of words and the grammatical structures are different, depending on if I'm writing uh, with Juan Rubio, which has been historically one of my main co-authors, or if I'm writing recently, I'm writing a few papers with Harald Ulik, and I think even just the casual reader will realize that the, the way in which the sentences are organized is different. Uh, and yes, you can use the chat GPT or any other type of generative AI, uh, artificial intelligence to rewrite what you do and maybe protect your identity. Again, just as an example, I run a small center at Penn. And uh, over there, sometimes I need to make offers. I, I recently hired um, a postdoc. And the problem is that my offer letters didn't, I don't know how to say it. It's not that they were wrong, but didn't look like very Dean-like. They didn't really look like they were coming from the dean's office and that caused a couple of problems in the past because the dean's office complained that the language was not formal enough. So I just put the letter of the letter 
to my postdoc in ChatGPT and I say, rewrite this letter as if it came from the dean's office. And it did it perfectly. The dean's office was very happy. So certainly you can use that to mask your identity. But yes, the, the, the thing is you really leave grammatical and semantic fingerprints in every single thing that you write and you need to be aware of that. Any other question? There's a couple more questions from, from the chat. Manuel, do you want to go ahead and ask? Um, sure. Uh, my question is if the academics community welcome this kind of models in the papers or there is too much skepticism still around there? Well, I will answer that question at two levels. Uh, first of all, and there are good reasons to be a skeptic if you are using things like ChatGPT because we don't really know what ChatGPT is, no, is doing. And that's why I think that using open source large language models like Llama may be a better way to go for academia in general. Because you know, if I'm going to use, let's suppose I use Llama to summarize a lot of corporate reports, I can tell the referee, look, this is the model, this is how I train it. You can actually look at line by line of the code and um, you can replicate fully. Now, the problem is with ChatGPT, you cannot replicate it fully. So I think there are some things that we need to accept as a profession. And one of them is I think we should by default use as often as we can open source where everything is checkable and everything is replicable. Okay, we are always a little bit worried about what type of secret sauce the people at OpenAI are putting on top of ChatGPT. Second, um, are you going to encounter resistance? Yeah, at the beginning, you are going to be, un, you know, most of us uh, have been unlucky in the past with referees who maybe didn't quite see what this was going to be so important in the in the long run, some new theories. I, you know, the paper that gave me tenure and made me relatively well known in the profession, which was applying the particle filter to, to economics, and now the particle filter is everywhere and you see thousands and thousands of citations. We send it to a journal, I'm not going to say which journal, but it's one of the top five journals. And the editor brought me a letter that was shameful. I mean, it was absolutely awful. The editor didn't understand anything and the referees didn't understand anything and the paper got rejected. That's what happens every time you're trying to do something new. Uh, you are always going to find some people that do not quite see where this is going. I think that the power of large language models is so big and artificial intelligence more in general that this is going to be overcome. Having said that, let me also point out that uh, just because you are doing a large language model or because you are using artificial intelligence doesn't make it a good paper. I get a lot of papers as an editor. I get a lot of papers on artificial intelligence these days and I reject a lot. I, I don't reject them because they are artificial intelligence. I just reject them because I don't think they're a good paper. And I think that a lot of the junior researchers confuse these two things. One thing is to have artificial intelligence of large language models to write a good paper. A very different thing is that that paper is good. <laughs> okay, And we should not forget about that. And the papers I try to point out in the review of applications in economics are papers that I like. So for instance, this one by Gabe, Koyen, and Yogo, I saw it at the NBR Summer Institute. I like it a lot. Okay, well, maybe some other people like it less. I'm not an expert in finance, but I thought it was a very good paper. I thought this is a very clever way to apply large language models to economics. I saw another couple of papers, since I didn't like them, I'm not going to cite them, but I saw another couple of papers that I was, this is absolutely brainless. Okay, yes, because you are using a large language model is not making it a good paper. But yes, you need to be aware that every time a new research agenda comes, you may be unlucky and bump into referees and editors who are going to be reluctant to embrace change. At the end of the day, you, if you believe that what you are doing is good, you need to keep trying it. And you know, I eventually published my paper on the particle filter and it didn't turn out so bad for me. Any other question? Okay, very good. So I think this is a good moment to make, I was asked by Alexi to make like a 10 minutes break in the middle. This is a good uh, moment, uh, but let me summarize uh, what we have done so far. So I have tried to tell you a little bit what a large language model is, and I have tried to tell you how it can apply to economics, and um, in particular, why there is a lot of information in text and that information can be exploited in ways that I find useful. What I'm going to do in the second half 
is now I'm going to get, after 10 minutes, I'm going to get much more into details. So suddenly we are going to start seeing a lot of equations. We are going to start seeing a lot of algebra, but stay with me. I think that this is what is going to fill a lot of the gaps. And my particular experience is that without getting your hands dirty with some of these details, some of the words I just told you before and some of the explanations are a little bit too vague for practical purposes. So stay with me. I promise that I think at the end by 12 p.m. Eastern time, you may have a little bit of a better understanding of what these large language models are. But let me stop share and we stop for maybe 10 minutes. Sounds good. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Take 10 Thank minutes, you. everybody. Maybe eat an energy bar or something. Jesus is going to throw some algebra at us in the second half. And uh, <laughs> good. Yeah, and some and some serious differential geometry. Nice. See you in a few. Okay, so uh, welcome back. And in, in this second half of the lecture, I want to emphasize uh, a little bit more of the details of what we uh, did so far. So in particular, let me get into some of the ideas of natural language processing. And so natural language processing or N N NLP, which we are going to find in many textbooks and papers, is the field that is specialized in how computers can deal with language that is appears in natural context. And by natural context here, we mean the speech, text, etc. Of course, text is not very natural. We need to learn to, to write. And when we write, we tend to do it in a very different way than when we speak. But nonetheless, it basically refers to this type of situations. And as you can imagine, this was one of the very first applications of computers all the way to the start of modern computer science. In 1954, Georgetown and IBM team up to come up with the first automatic translation uh, software. It was to translate text from Russian into English. You know, this is the peak of the Cold War. There were a lot of open source material in Russian, for instance, the newspapers published in the Soviet Union that uh, the U.S. could not translate efficiently because it didn't have enough experts in Russian. And what IBM and Georgetown were able to do was to code a simple software that could translate simple Russian sentences with a surprising level of accuracy. And people got very excited. They basically say, oh, this is fantastic. This is 1954. And there was actually uh, someone forecasting that by the early 1960s, we will have a nearly perfect or human level translation through computers. Well, it didn't quite work out, had to wait a little bit longer. But this classical uh, natural language processing was based on symbolic rules. Okay, And I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, talking about those in the interest of time. Sufficient to say that the idea was we are going to come up with a very, very long set of rules. Okay, so this is um, the idea of the Chinese room by John Searle, who was a philosopher at Berkeley. And he said, look, translating between Chinese and English is difficult because Chinese use a very different grammar, very different semantic. But if I just can come up with all the rules that will map Chinese into English, I could put a ball over here with a Chinese character. I could check the rule in a gigantic book and get an output that will be good idiomatic English. So we just need to figure it out, these rules. And by setting up these rules, there was some early successes like ELISA, which was a chatbot back in the day from 1966, which was a psychotherapist. And ELISA actually worked surprisingly well. I played with it when I was an undergrad. And it will actually engage in conversations that make uh, some sense, of course, within a very, very uh, simple approach. And this was the ideas behind Noam Chomsky's view of having a universal grammar. Basically, the idea was that all human brains are hardwired in such a way that all language is a structure in a very simple set of rules, and all human languages are particular applications of those set of rules. So the only thing we need to do is uncover those rules, code them in the computer, and we are done. Unfortunately, after some early success, the field stagnated. And the reason why the field stagnated is because it turns out to be the case that uncovering those rules, even if they exist, we don't know if they exist, is actually surprisingly difficult. 
in comparison, modern NLP is completely built around the statistical models. It's only about a stochastic pairings of tokens. And that's really the base of its recent success and why there is a consensus that large language models have refuted Chomsky's approach to language. And why I think a lot of people in the field are really moving away from these ideas. So let me tell you a detail exactly of how this works. I told you before, I don't know if you remember at the very start of the presentation that the era of large, sorry, of deep learning starts in the early 2012. And this basically happens with the introduction of deep neural networks. One of the first applications of neural networks was image recognition. In particular, there is a competition called ImageNet, ImageNet competition or challenge, which basically has a lot of photographs of different breeds of dogs. Okay, so you need to, I, I give the neural network a photograph and the, and the, and the neural network needs to decide, is this a German Shepherd or is this a Chihuahua or is this a Bulldog? And around 2010, 2011, the um, neural networks, which were shallow, were getting an error of around 28%, you know, with small improvements from year to year, but we didn't really have much advance. And this is the level of human error, okay? Humans make mistakes also classifying dog breeds. And then a group of researchers at McGill University in Canada, uh, Canada is, is a country that has been at the leader, uh, in a leadership position in, in artificial intelligence and is still today at, at the very front of research over there, came up with a deep neural network. Instead of having one layer, they had eight. And if you want to understand a little bit better why having different layers instead of just one layer, while keeping the total number of parameters constant, so this is not I have eight layers, so I have more parameters. No, this is I have the same layers here. I have the same parameters in a shallow network but I'm going to organize it in eight layers instead of a one very large layer is going to work very well. If you want to know the details about that, please check my video from last year, okay? I explained that over there, I think, in, in some good detail. But the point is, the only thing that you need to learn today is that that improved from 26% human, uh, sorry, uh, error rate to 16%. This was a 10% jump in just one year. And as soon as people realize how important this was, they kind of fine tune, you know, they went from eight layers to 22 layers to 152 layers. By the time we are in 2015, neural networks are doing better than humans. And this is the deep learning revolution. It starts in 2012 with AlexNet. Now, people go and say, so oh. Can I, can I pose for a more philosophical question? Arpit, do you want to go ahead and ask it? Of course. Yeah, so this is about the argument against Chomsky's, uh, you know, natural grammar idea. So it, it seems to be that humans learn language with orders of magnitude less training data than LLM. So, so that sort of seems to me argument in favor of the idea that we have some innate language processing skills, because how else are we able to kind of replicate the ability of, of chat GPT with, you know, way less data? It must be that we have some innate grammar. Okay, well, uh, yes and no. So what people like Piantadosi, this is the paper I'm pointing out, will tell you is that we actually learn a lot because we <clears throat> don't start speaking until we are in the, you know, 24, 26 months and that we actually hear a lot of words. So it's not even obvious that uh, we need, we don't got, we don't have that gigantic amounts of data. And also remember, small kids are not able to write very sophisticated sentences or so they are not able to, come up with very sophisticated uh, paragraphs or conversations. It's only when you get to college that you are able to write a relatively sophisticated essay. And then later when you are in graduate school that you can start writing something that uh, looks um, sufficiently professional. And even graduate students, <laughs> you know, assistant professors struggle all the time writing introductions for their papers. So I will argue that it takes you 25 years of training and hearing thousands of thousands of thousands of thousands of pages of text before you are able to write a good paragraph. So in that sense, I'm not sure I agree that we don't have that little training data. Um, but the point is that 
Chomsky makes a very strong statement. He doesn't make the statement, we learn because we have innate rules. He makes the statement, the only way we can learn is because we have innate rules. So in that sense, if he was saying that innate rules are sufficient for learning, he has a defense, but he's making a statement about the necessary, the necessity of those innate rules. And I think at the very least, large language models have shown that the necessity of innate rules is not there. That large language models do surprisingly well without any type of innate rule. Okay, not a good year for Chomsky. Last couple of years, uh, I don't think his research agenda has, you know, <laughs> aged very well all of the sudden. Anyway, but uh, coming back uh, to the point, I was I was mentioning before we have this um, this argument that we have these deep neural networks, and people are like, "Wow, this is so fantastic! They work so well with images." So let's apply the same idea to text. And there was a little bit of a disappointment. Basically, the concrete architecture that one uses in this type of situation is called a convolutional neural network. And that neural networks actually do not work very well with language. And uh, let me erase that. That's not what I wanted to do. They don't work very well with language. We also use something called recursive neural networks that seem to work well with, uh, with time series. Someone asked before about time series. They don't seem to work very well. There is a sense of disappointment. There is a sense by the end of 2017 that the deep learning revolution is not being applied to text, that there is something missing. And that's where attention is all you need comes. It's a group of researchers affiliated with Google. And what they say is no, what we are going to do is have a complete different architecture. We are not going to use convolutional neural networks. We are not going to use recursive neural networks. We are going to use a transformer. And the transformers, as I was saying before, is a very general structure, it's a very general architecture that is in fact going to be able to map everything that is a mapping from set to set. And by the way, this is the idea that I use in one of my recent papers on high dimensional dynamic programming, where we say exactly that, that what you really want to do is focus on mappings of sets to sets. I'm not going to bore you with the details. If you want, I can chat a little bit more later at the end of the presentation. But the whole point is that everyone in the field is like, wow. So the paper circulates as a working paper in December, 2017. On August the 2nd, when I was checking these slides, it has 84,000 Google Scholar citations. I don't know how many of you check your Google citations. I have slightly over 13,000 in all my papers from the beginning of times. And yet these guys have like what, seven times, six and a half times all my citations in just three years, which kind of you know puts in perspective what I have been able to accomplish in life. And okay, so what do these guys do? They actually propose two ideas. The first idea is self-attention. That's why the paper is called attention is all you need. The other idea is the encoder, the coder structure. Turns out to be the case that only one is important. The encoding, the coding is not that important. It was a little bit of a red herring, but you know, that happens all the time when we are doing new research. You know, we think that really matters at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter that much. Now, you may want to learn more about uh, this idea of the transformer. As fast as my understanding goes, there is only three good books. There is a lot of cookbook. Um, you know, if you go to Amazon, you will find a lot of books with the word transformers over there, they are not very good. So I'm only going to tell you the three books that I, I, I can think of that have some quality, even those they are not fantastically exciting. You have this one by Louis Tornstall, Leandro Bonverra, and Thomas Wolf, Natural Language Processing with Transformers. It's kind of a nice, simple introduction. A little bit more math, the Transformers for Machine Learning, a deep dive by Kamat, Graham, and Emara. And finally, the only book that, as far as I can tell, places this transformer model within the general context of invasion models is by Gethard Paas and Sven Gienselbach. And the good thing about this book is that it's actually open access, so you can get it for free and check it out. None of the three books is fantastic. They are the best. 
that they are out there, but they are not fantastic. And my suspicion is that probably in the fall uh, or maybe in 2024, we will have a new crop of books. But you know, this is as far as we get. If you are only going to get one, get this one by Pass and Gesselbach because it's free and it has most of the ideas. Okay, so there are eight steps into building a transformer model. So imagine that you know we uh, you hire me and you say, look, we we are going to create this new company that you have fifty million dollars as a seed capital and let's build our own transformer model. What will be the different steps? Of course, in practice, we'll probably not take that much money because we can borrow on a lot of things that uh, has already been done. But you know, imagine we are like three years ago and we are open AI and we want to do this. So what we will need to do? We will need first to formalize text. Then we will need to do some text wrangling. Then we will need to do some tokenization, then embedding, attention, output, and training. And then if we have time, I will tell you a little bit about extensions and where the field is now as of the summer of 2023. And of course, this is really an area of research where a lot of things are changing. So if I give this talk in six months, some of the stuff I may tell you will be quite different. And that's why I'm going to try my best to keep these slides and the link is at the beginning updated. I'm teaching this stuff in many places, many central banks and many institutions. So I need to update them anyway. And I always like to share everything that I do with the profession at large. But uh, questions about uh, transformer models, kind of this very different general idea, and or can I get into formalizing the test? Very good. So let me tell you then about some uh, terminology. And first, let me tell you what a corpus is. This is something you are going to encounter. The corpus is the data set under consideration, which can be the corporate reports, the political speeches, speeches, statements, core decisions, you name it. Now, something that uh, some of us know because we uh, study in Southern Europe, in continental Europe, but some of you who come from different uh, cultural traditions may not know. Corpus is a neutral noun in Latin from the third declension, which means that the plural nominative, which is what you want to use, is corpora. Okay, so it's kind of funny, corpus corpora, but you know, that's what declensions do for you. The document is each of the components of the corpus. And inside the document, you are going to have terms, usually words, but they may be graphs, they may be photographs, they may be video. So that's why we are going to use a more general uh, word for it. And we are also going to have engrams. And engrams are going to be adjacent terms that for whatever the reason we want to handle together. So we probably want to think about the United States as a term and not of United and States separately. And in similar way, in many papers, we want to think about high unemployment as coming together and not as two different words, or federal funds rate. That may be a better example than high unemployment. We also may encounter metadata, which is all the type of covariates associated with each document, for instance, time stamps, but those are not always going to be present. So metadata may or may not exist. So what is text? Formally, a text is just an order string of characters, okay? So let me uh, go over here and let me give you some text, European Central Bank. And in this text, what we have is an E and a U and an R and an O and a P and so on and so forth. And it makes sense because it's order. It has a particular order that gives it away. In the context of this presentation, most of these strings will belong to the Latin alphabet that we use in English, both in lowercase and in capital case. But there may be also be decorated Latin, Latin letters. So for instance, Jesus, my first name, has an accent, an acute accent on you. There are many other decorations in other European languages. We also have non-Latin alphabetic characters. We may be dealing with texts that are either in Chinese or in Arabic or in Hebrew, or that just incorporates a few words from those uh, languages. We are going to have punctuation. We are going to have, of course, white spaces, tabs, new lines, numbers, and alphabetic numeric characters. And we need our model to understand all of those. So, you know, at the end of the day, 
text, just think about text as an ordered string of characters. And the first thing that we need to do is text wrangling. So the first wrangling is the preprocessing of text to get a cleaner representation. So you go to the internet. So let's use the example that I employ to motivate this presentation. Imagine that we get all the articles from the Financial Times. Well, what you are going to get is some gigantic file from the Financial Times, or maybe if you are using the Financial Times from the 19th century, you will just get a bunch of photocopies from your local library. And you need to obtain a cleaner representation. And this is what I'm going to call the secret source of large language models. And this is very important. Most of the textbooks that you are going to read, most of the videos you are going to see on the internet already assume you, you have been able to pre-process your information. And the reason is because these textbooks and videos are usually written by people in computer science and applied math that, because of their field, are interested in the algorithm itself. I'm not, I'm not criticizing them. I'm just saying that, you know, that's what they do for a living. So that's what they, that's what they do. But the problem is we, in economics, it is likely that we are going to take the algorithm as given and that our really concern is going to be how do we get those strings into something we can deal with. Okay. In fact, Rattenbury and his co-authors claim that between 50 to 80% of real life data analysis is precisely about this. And this is a book I used back in the day that helped me to learn a lot, Principles of Data Wrangling. Okay, so don't underestimate this. If you are going to get into this field, be aware that it may be the case that, you know, of the one year that it takes you to write this paper, eight months of that year is to get a data set that you can use properly. Now, if you are lucky and that data set is already prepared, great for you, but, you know, don't get this encouraged because this is not something you can go to the internet, download it into your computer and be done in half an hour, okay? And this is often a challenge because you need to approach many problems like separate metadata from text, identify relevant portions of the text, remove graphs and charts. And of course, you need to be very worried about copyright. You know, uh, you need to be very worried about cons consent. You need to be worried about safety and the privacy considerations. Some of you asked me before about uh, you know, um, um, uh, outing people from the referee reports. Yes, I really have the ability to uh, disclose a lot of information. Some of you probably are aware that during the MBR Summer Institute, there was a paper presented about uh, who was posting in Econ Market, job, uh, in Econ job Market rumors. And I actually believe that that paper was not ethical. I don't think that what they did is uh, a lot of people who participated in that forum, as unpleasant as some of the comments are, uh, were under the, and I never brought over there. And when I was director of graduate studies, I asked my graduate students at Penn never to post over there because I didn't think it was a healthy forum for the profession at large, but people who posted over there were under the presumption of uh, privacy and that I don't think that taking advantage of uh, computers to do, to unravel this privacy is going to be good for anyone in the long run. So you need to be aware of those things and please respect them. Now, um, sometimes it's going to be difficult and sometimes you may need to resort to opti optical character recognition. There is a whole field over there on optical character recognition. Melissa Dell at Harvard, she has been doing a fantastic job at uh, getting very powerful OCR software I open source for the profession at uh, large. In fact, this is another possible application of deep learning. Shen at all is a very nice uh, layout parser for doing uh, this type of uh, things. And you know, you may need to find some more specialized uh, software. Uh, and if all else fails, you need to resort to manual extraction. And you know, that may take a lot of time, but I'm 
quickly pointing out here a book by Neil Ferguson, The House of Rothschilds, for two reasons. First of all, because it's a fantastic book in economic history that everyone uh, will enjoy. But second, because Ferguson was very clever. So the Rothschild have this great um, set of diaries that they have kept for decades and decades, but they were written in a very particular shorthand and uh, in a mix of Yiddish and German that made very difficult for uh, historians, for previous historians uh, to uh, process. And what he did was to train a small set of research assistants. He actually told what they need to know. You know, there were people who already know Yiddish or German. And so he, told, he taught them what they needed to know to read the, the, um, the diaries and also the, the shorthand. And he asked them to uh, tape the, the, the diary. So he actually will listen to, to the whole diaries on, on, I guess, on some MP3, and he could go like a 200% and skip to the interesting parts. So, you know, be creative. Even if you need to resort to manual extraction, at the end of the day, you are going to be able to get a lot of information in an efficient way. And this is just a joke that I always uh, tell people. Uh, it's from a famous computer scientist guy. I once acquired the complete dog licensing database for Cook County, Illinois. For those of you who are not from the US, that's where the city of Chicago is. So it's a very big county. And instead of requiring the person registering their dog to choose a bread from a list, the creators of the system had simply given them a text field to type into. As a result, I had 250 different spellings of Chihuahua, which I think it kind of illustrates the point over here. Okay, so you are going to have a lot of inconsistent spelling. Things are going to change over time. Historical spelling has changed in many situations, etc. And that's the reason why Python has become so important. So uh, to deal with these things, with all this uh, uh, brangling uh, properly, you need to use something called regular expressions. And this is a very funny uh, joke. I don't know how many of you check this guy X. KCD, but this has a lot of these cartoons on the internet about computer science that sometimes are quite hilarious. And, you know, he basically, this, this joke, you can read it on your own, is about how using regular expressions you can parse through megs and megs of information, or even terabytes of information efficiently. And that's why Python is so important. And basically, it's because Python, you can click over here has the most powerful regular expression capabilities of all languages out there. That's why Python really became the mainstream of using text analysis and in general of machine learning. And that's why if you are going to work on this area, probably it makes sense for you to get familiar with Python. And it's because regular expressions are particularly well dealt with Python. Of course, you can do things with other programming languages. For instance, R also has very nice and regular expression mm -hmm. themes. And maybe you want to do this. This is kind of a cheat sheet for doing all these regular expressions in R. And you know, R is probably a, a good close second to Python in terms of doing regular expressions. If you were, you know, for whatever the reason wanted to run some of this stuff in other programming languages, you may need to understand that regular expressions are going to be a, a problem for you. Now, again, I will love to spend another couple of hours, three hours teaching you about regular expressions. When I teach my computational course at Penn, we go into some detail about regular expressions. But basically the idea at the end of the day, what you want to know is I'm going to have these strings. These strings are going to come in very complicated ways. And basically what the people from OpenAI are going to do is they are, I'm pretty sure, I don't know the details, but I'm pretty sure they have a few top software engineers who are top experts on regular expressions, they apply the secret sauce and they get the file that they can use. But having said that, let's imagine that we have the file, we have downloaded the whole Financial Times into a nice data set, we have cleaned it, we have used good software, and now we have our data set. But before moving on, questions about text wrangling and text in general. Very good. So let me move now and let me tell you about tokenization. So what in the world is uh, tokenization? So the idea of tokenization is that we are going to split the raw character string that we have put into our file 
into useful semantic pieces for processing. And we are going to call those tokens. And that's why before I was saying tokens already and why we are going to call this tokenization. So for instance, we are going to have the European Central Bank is in Frankfurt and I want to split it into the European Central, et cetera. Now, usually this is going to be words in the language like European or Central, but sometimes they may be something different. For instance, they can be characters, they can be numbers, they can be punctuation. And also we need to think about how to deal with funny things like risk averse. Is risk averse two words, risk and averse, or is just one word? Or aren't, is are and not, or is aren't altogether? And that's why they are very good specialized libraries for tokenization. And what you are going to do is you are going to use one of those tokenization libraries. You do not want to write your own tokenization library. So for instance, in ChatGPT, I'm going to skip a lot of material. What you do is the following. We are going to, what these libraries do is they are going to come up with a vocabulary. So a vocabulary is a list of all the allowed tokens. The Oxford English Dictionary has around 170,000 words in current usage uh, versus around 1 million that has been ever used in English. The thing is there has been a spelling changes as I was mentioning before and words that we don't use anymore or that belong to all English. In practice, most of us, even if you have high education and you are a native speaker, so your vocabulary is larger than mine, we only use around 20 to 25,000 words in a day-to-day -day conversation. In addition to it, we have a lot of concrete techno uh, technical terms like we have in economics when we say things like stochastic. And when you put all these together, we actually find that we use around 40,000 words, which by the way, follow a very clear SIPS law. So as you probably know, the SIPS law is going to tell you the rank of how often we use this word with how you know the frequency the log of the frequency and it has this nice power law which means that there are words like the and is etc that we use a lot and words like heterosasticity that we don't use that often and we are going to have our vocabulary now for an specialized llm like the ones we want to use in economics we may want to take a vocabulary from a generic large language model and have add maybe a few specific extra words. In economics, I will say you will probably get away with adding another 1,000 to 2,000 words. So you will take the, the 40,000 words from a generic vocabulary and may throw another 2,000. And the way you will do it is using domain knowledge. So domain knowledge, doesn't mean anything more than you open, you know, David Krebs textbook in micro and you go over the textbook and you figure it out which are the words in the index that are not in our vocabulary, in our generic vocabulary, but yet show up on Krebs textbook. We can also think about issues like linguistic roots and multi-words phrases, like I was saying before, the United States. Okay, but let's suppose we have done all that and slides uh, 60, 61, and uh, give you a little bit more information about it. An introduction to information retrieval by Manning and co-authors will also give you more information about it. But at the end of the day, in the interest of time, let me jump directly to the tokenizer in GPT-3. And the tokenizer is here and it's very easy to use. So we are going to say European Central Bank and we are going to so the way ChatGPT does is it says it's going to split into the token European, it's going to split it into the token central, and it's going to split it into bank. And you say, well, but those are just the three regular words. Well, if I use a slightly different tokenizer, a sorry word like encoding, encoding has to do this, I think, in English. Code an example, you will see that now is doing a little bit more sophisticated because the word encoding 
Oh, apparently it's with word. Okay. Embedding. I think that will be a word that exists. Oh, yes. Embedding. Okay. So now the word embedding is going to be tokenized into embed and link. So it's not a perfect one-to-one -one mapping. And basically the reason is because things like INGs, we want to separate them from embed. And it's basically because you don't want to have like too many variations of the same word. But that's what we do. Okay, so a tokenizer, basically what it does is takes a string of characters and separates these in tokens, which are usually words, but sometimes are kind of just the root of the word and some suffix. And in this case, we have nine tokens. The way in which GPT-3 does this is using a particular tokenizer called bit pair encoding. Uh, you have over there the web page where it will tell you exactly uh, how it is done. It's very nice. And uh, what it's going to do is going to drop odd words. In particular, the vocabulary of GPT-3 is going to have 50,257 tokens, which are the 40,000 tokens, the 40,000 words I was telling you that you need to write good English, the 25,000 words of a well-educated person, plus around 15,000 words of um, specialized technical knowledge in different fields. And that's what uh, ChatGPT does. And if you have other words that are not these ones, we just forget about them, and I will tell you how we how we handle them in the text. Okay. And for memory reasons, you probably don't want to have a vocabulary that is large at two to the power of eight, because this is what we can usually load on GPUs and on on a processor. So you don't want to have a vocabulary that is more than sixty-five thousand tokens. You know, this is larger than the 50,000 tokens in ChatGPT, so that actually works. And then we are going to have this vocabulary. And what we are going to do is we are going to give each token an ID. Okay, so European has the ID 2000, 22,030. And this is just to transform the token into a vector. So that's our first step. And going back, oops. Going back to the web page that I was using before, you see over here, it says token IDs. I can click on the token ID and you will see that European is 22,030, example is 220. Okay. So a question, is this something you do if you are trying to design GPT from scratch or is it something you do to use one of these large language models? Yeah, no, no, this is something you will do if you are trying to do it from scratch. Now we are, this whole, this whole last part of the, of the lecture is, imagine you give me $50 million and we are doing GPT from scratch, okay? Since you are Argentinian, you know, some crazy Argentinian president decides we need to do import substitution of large language models and we are going to do an Argentinian GPT. So this is the first step I will need to do, coming up with my own tokenizer, okay? Now, the reason why I'm explaining this is because you may need to take, if you are going to apply this to economics, you may need to add to the standard tokenizer the extra words in economics that you may need. Now, ChatGPT is very good and it has words like monopoly. Okay, so it will do this thing in mon and opoly and the tokenizer will do it for you. But it may be the case that there is a very specific term of art in economics that doesn't recognize it, okay? But by and large, you are going to take the library as given. That's what I was saying, the tokenizer. That's what I was saying over here. In practice, you are going to use the specialized library for tokenization. In fact, ChatGPT doesn't even have its own tokenizer. It uses this thing called byte pair encoding to do the, the tokenization, okay? Now, a technical detail that will be useful just to remember in one second, we are actually going to take not 22,030, we are going to write a one hot vector. So one hot vectors, for those of you who uh, do not know this terminology, means it's a vector of zeros that has zeros everywhere, except in this particular case, the position 22,030, which will be a one, okay? 
So what we have done is we have taken the word European Central Bank, or the, sorry, the string European Central Bank, and we have transformed it into a matrix with three rows. The first row is 0000, 000, 000, 000, 000 with a one in position 22,030. The second row is 0000, 000, 000, 000 with a one in entry 5694, and a third vector a third row with zero zero zeros except a one in entry 50 5018. So we have take any particular text and we have make a matrix with it. Okay. The rows are going to be each of the tokens and the columns are going to be all of them zeros except the ones where the tokenizer is given us where we are in the in the in the vocabulary. Now, in practice, if the text is very long, we are not going to have one matrix that is tremendously long because that will be problematic. We are only going to have blocks of 2048 tokens. I will explain that in a second. Okay. So we are going to take European Central Bank, only has three tokens. So the other 2,045 are going to be empty spaces, and we are just going to have a particular entry in the vocabulary for an empty space. And we have transformed European Central Bank into a matrix that has 2,048 rows and 50,000, how much I say before, uh, uh, 257 columns. Okay, and this is a this is a very sparse matrix. It only has three ones in position one, row, column 22,000, row two, column 5,000, and row three, position, uh, column 5,018. Everything else is zeros, but now we have a matrix. So we have gone from having a string European Central Bank up to a matrix. And now what we are going to do is the embedding. And this is absolutely the key. So if you are if you want to pay attention, the next five minutes of the presentation are actually the most important of all the presentation. Now, the idea of embedding is the following. In natural language, words bundle in predictable patterns. So the probability that by looking at the um, articles in the Financial Times, I will see bank following European and central is very large. It's a probability that is much larger than zero. But the probability that the word giraffe will follow European and central is zero or close to zero. In fact, I check in the Financial Times and in Google, I didn't find a single case of European central giraffe. Although, you know, you could imagine the European Union creating the European central giraffe in some type of crazy institution. It's a, it's a grammatically correct uh, string, okay? It means we can use these probabilities to generate predictions. And what we want to do is to take this vector, this one hot vector into a representation that has a good informational content. And that informational content is going to be called an embedding. In particular, I want to transform my word zero, 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 one, and then a bunch of zeros into an end dimensional vector. And this end dimensional vector will be like 0 0.3, 0 point, this is supposed to be up there, 0 0.4, 0 0.01, etc. Okay. And to this vector, we are going to add then context information. And that's why this will answer Alexis' point about why is this LLM, this large language model, being able to generate text that looks like human text. Now, why do we do this? Well, there are two reasons why we embed this one shot, one hot vector, sorry, into an embedding. First of all is dimensionality reduction. Okay, we are dealing with 50,257 tokens. That's a very highly dimensional vector space. So we are going to embed it into something much lower. Let's suppose we could do it with three. 
So n will be three. We are going to say every word has three dimensions. Now, in practice, to this to work, three dimensions are not going to be enough. A chat GPT is going to use 12,000 dimensions, which you say, well, it doesn't look that less than 50,000, but yes, it's much less. 12,000 is way less than 50,000. And there are some memory reasons in computer architecture why that makes a difference. But let me give you an example. And this is the example I always use to motivate. Imagine that I have a list of journals in economics, okay? And I have the QGE, and I have Econometrica, and I have the Journal of Mathematical Economics, and I have the Journal of Economic Theory, and I have the Journal of Econometrics. And we have a paper. And I say, okay, so this is the paper I just wrote. Okay, I'm going to call it Great GP for Great Paper. Okay, so GFB has written Great Paper. And it's trying to think to which of these journals should I submit it? And the problem is that these different journals have different emphasis, different approaches. We know that QGE likes a lot papers that are very interesting, a lot of intuition, a lot of data. Econometrica, on the other hand, is a journal that values a lot of uh, methodological innovations. The Journal of Mathematical Economics, as the name indicates, is very much into mathematical. And maybe you have the Journal of Economic History, which likes a lot of stuff with history. So how do I do this? Well, what I can do is I can embed each of these journals into a vector. And this vector, let me do it in two dimensions, is going to be, and I'm sorry, this is just an example. So I'm not, I'm not trying to, to irritate anyone, but one is going to be formality. You know how formal each journal is in terms of how much they like um, uh, having like theorems and proofs and lemmas versus more verbal arguments. And the other one is data content, how much empirics they want. And what we are going to have, let me change colors, is that we have journals like the Journal of Mathematical Economics. So the Journal of Mathematical Economics, I'm going to say, is going to be a journal that likes papers with a lot of formalism and not a lot of data. The Journal of Applied Econometrics, maybe here, We'll add, since it's applied econometrics, we like to have a lot of data and maybe not that much formalism. And the Journal of Economic History, we like to have a lot of data because this is a journal on history and having maybe less formalism. You don't see that many theorems in the Journal of Economic Theory. So what I'm doing is I'm mapping a whole set of journals, which may have hundreds of journals into two dimensions. The first dimension is formalism. The second dimension is data content. And that's embedding. That's transforming. You know, QGE will be journal one in my list. So I will have, so QGE will be a vector one, zero, 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 zero. Econometrica is number two, zero, one, zero, zero, zero. Journal of Mathematical Economics is number three, zero, zero, one, zero, 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 and so on and so forth. I have 600 of these journals and I map all of them into a two dimensional vector. And by doing that, not only I do a dimensionality reduction, I transform a list of journals into a more informative space. Of course, the problem is going to be the interpretability of this more formal space. But the idea is that deep neural networks are very, very good at doing this. This is what neural networks are fantastic at, is I just give them a bunch of journals, a list of journals, I give them a bunch of articles in the journal, and they are going to get this two-dimensional interpretation, okay? As I was mentioning before, we do this in blocks of tokens, but we could do it also one token at a time. And this is the embedding. Uh, yeah. Is there an analogy here with uh, principal component analysis? Exactly, that's exactly, that. that's exactly what it is. Embedding is principal component on asteroids, okay? And let me jump. Then since you asked this question, exactly, to, this is a graph I already used before, you know, you take object one. So object one is either a token, or in my example before, a journal, or an image, and you do this principal component analysis on asteroids that we call embedding, and we get a vector. Okay? And in particular, the way we are going to do this is very simple. It cannot be any dumbbell. At a, at a very fundamental level, 
this is really high school algebra. Because remember, we have this block I told you before. We have this block of tokens of 2,048 uh, uh, tokens and 50,227 columns. So this, remember, is 0, 0, 0, 001, 0, 0, 001, 0, 0, 0, et cetera. And I'm going to multiply by a matrix. Now, I'm going to tell you later how we pick that matrix, but it's nothing more than a matrix multiplication. And that matrix is going to be 50,227 times the dimension of the embedding. GPT is a very powerful language, so we want to have a very rich dimension. It's going to be 12,228. And we have this now matrix of 2048 rows and 12,228 columns. And European gets embedded into 0 0.01, minus 0 0.99, blah, 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 0 0.34, 0 0.12. Okay? I, I just make these numbers up. These are not the numbers from ChatGPT because ChatGPT doesn't want to tell you what the embedding is. Okay? But if you go to Llama, in Llama, you can just look at the embedding. By the way, I'm going to show you later code in Python so you can actually run this your, on your own. Okay? So don't stay with me. I don't have a lot of time, but I'll try at least to show you where the code is. But this is basically what you are doing. You are taking these strings. So remember what we have done so far. We have European Central Bank. Okay, so first, we go to the Financial Times. Second, we get the string European Central Bank. Three, we tokenize it into a block B, and now we just embed it. Of course. Someone was telling me, Jesus, Jesus, what is the relation between this and deep learning? Well, it's because we are going to use deep learning to determine this embedding matrix. But we could do it in some other way. So deep learning is very useful to do this, but it's not essential. Okay. And what is the amazing thing about embedding is that now we have defined a vector space where every position in that vector space has one particular meaning is, you know, before when I was talking about the space of journals, some particular combination of formalism and data. And the good thing is, since I'm working on a vector space, I can apply standard linear algebra uh, considerations. So I can do the following. Imagine that the embedding of European is this one and that the embedding of central is this one. I just can sum them and I have a new set, a new vector, sorry. And then what I can go is I look at my vocabulary, which is the word, which is the token that is the closest to this vector, to this sum. And it happens to be bank. And if I have a sufficiently rich vocabulary, and I have a sufficiently rich embedding, I'm going to get this right. Not only I can just sum two vectors. So this is, think about this is how amazing this is. I have transformed the word European into an embedding. I have transformed the word central into an embedding. And it turns out to be the case when I sum the two of them, it gives me a new vector that happens to be bank. But I can define any other operation. I can say, look, let me define European Commission, which is in, in itself, will be the sum of this embedding and the other embedding for commission. Let me define another embedding from Brussels. And now I have European Central Bank. I get another embedding and I subtract it. And it turns out to be the case that the, the sum, I go again to my vocabulary, most likely it will be Frankfurt. And that's basically how I build text. I just start with my tokens. So I start European. I realize that the next thing that comes is central. After central, it will be bank. And then after bank, it will not be Frankfurt, it will probably be East. And then it will be at, and it will be at Frankfurt. And it just keeps doing this recursively. And that's why it can generate text. Just because we have these vectors that we just can add and subtract them and get the right embedding. And the amazing thing is that once I have done this, I have transformed my piece of information into this embedding, into this vector. I can do that with anything. 
I can just take your photograph, you know, the photograph of Pablo, and I can embed it into a vector, and that will be the photograph of Pablo. And then I can say the following operation. How will it look like the kit of Pablo with someone else? And, you know, take a photograph of my niece, Covadonga. Of my, uh, you will pick a photograph of my, of Covadonga, that will be another embedding, and you will sum, and you will sum the photograph of Cova with the photograph of Pablo, and that will be the synthetic kit of Pablo with Cova. And that's why Dal L can do things like make a photograph of a teddy bear playing uh, the guitar underwater. It just takes a photograph of a teddy bear, gets an embedding, gets the photograph of a, of a guitar, gets the embedding underwater, just sums all of them. And you know, that's where, of course, these models are very large and has a lot of details and skipping. You get the outcome, which is a teddy bear playing the guitar under the water. And because these embeddings are very highly nonlinear, that's why sometimes it gives you answers you don't quite understand, but yet it seems to have these emerging properties that it works very well. And that's why embedding is absolutely amazing. Embedding to me is one of the most amazing things I have learned in my life, is the fact that you can take any set of objects and spin out another set of vectors that roughly has the same information, except that these things are photographs, videos, sound recordings, and what you spit out are vectors. And then I just apply all the linear algebra I learned in high school, and I can do everything I want. Questions about embedding. Sorry, I got carried away in excitement, but embedding is such an amazing idea. You really, really need to appreciate this is, in my opinion, one of the biggest human accomplishments ever. Questions? Can you talk, uh, Jesus, about the dimensions here? So we went from 2,000 tokens to... <laughs> 12,000 really dimensional embedding. Yes. Dimensional embedding. So how do we how do we do that? I mean it's the sparsity there is going to be important or yes, yes. And of course that we are going to use GPUs. So remember at the very beginning I show you the share price of NVIDIA. Well, because this is perfect. A, a GPU is basically perfect to do this. It's, remember, this is the block. This block B, remember, is zero. Is it's a very sparse matrix. It's basically everything is zeros except ones from time to time. But okay. um, th this is the part that seems very different from principal components. It, it's, yes. Then it, in that case, we're always trying to reduce the dimensionality to just a few. And yeah. Here we seem to be increasing it. Can you comment on oh, that? Oh no, no, no. Because remember, these are the number of tokens. Yeah. This is your position in the vocabulary, because here it matters. <laughs> your position in the vocabulary matters. The, the word bank, and I'm going to have an example in one second, the word bank has a very particular meaning within a vocabulary. And that's why you need to keep the 50,000. So okay. this is the vocabulary. This is the vocabulary. This is the embedding vector, okay? So the, the dimensionality reduction is from 50,000 to 12,000. That's the dimensionality right. reduction. Okay? Got it. But, the, but the key is that this is a matrix multiplication of a sparse matrix that I can flash into my GPU and the GPU will be like, oh my God, this is for what I was designed. Woo! And do it in a moment. Well, not in a moment because you know these things are large, but this is why without GPUs, you are not able to do this. Okay? But this is the key. This is basically how we have moved from having things that look like objects that are very unstructured into vectors. Okay, now we need to add, and that goes all the way to the beginning when I show you the photograph of Elman and his paper, now the notion of context. Because the only thing I have done so far is having these vectors. And now I need to have the sense in which there is a context to these vectors. And now we need to use a, an idea that goes to distributional semantics by Firth. So Firth, this chap over here was a very famous English uh, linguist that has this great line. A word is characterized by the company it keeps. So let me give you, this is the example. You, you are going to see this example. I'm just not inventing it. But this is such a clear example. I sit in the bank. So what you mean over here by a bank is a bench. Okay, so there is a bench over here not writing a very good bench, but you know, I sit in that bank. Inside the bank office, now it's the same word bank, 
but now is used in a very different sense. This is a bank and I'm going to, you know, draw the traditional neoclassical building of old fashioned banks. Okay, in fact, the reason why I use bank to, re to refer to financial institution is precisely because in Italy, in the middle ages, uh, the, the Italian bankers seated in benches, that's why we call them banks, but now it's used in a different sense. I sit in the bank inside the bank office by the river bank. So what do I mean by the river bank? The river bank just means, you know, there is a river and the bank office, the financial institution is on the side of the bank. Where you bank? And now bank is a verb, it's not a noun anymore. And it refers to the fact that you conduct your financial operations in that institution. So in just one second, this, this sentence is cumbersome and you will probably not use it in real life, but I use the word bank as a bench. I use the word bank as a financial institution. I use the bank, the word bank as the site of a river and I use the word bank as a financial service. And what I need to know is in particular, how to distinguish bank here from bank here. And I'm going to use something called encoding. And this is going to be basically looking at the positions of a word within a sentence. And this is going to capture the idea of context of Elman. Okay. Now, how you do this is going to be very language dependent. In the same way that tokenization or building a vocabulary, the ideas will be roughly the same in different languages. You will just have a vocabulary in Hebrew, a vocabulary in Arabic. You will have a vocabulary in English. This is going to be very language dependent. And think about, for instance, in English, you can say, I sit in the bank. And the reason you know is in the bank is because you use words in the. And that's because English is an analytic language. However, there are other languages like Latin that are synthetic, where you don't use in the, you will use the declension, the inflection of the noun. So coming back to my answer before to Pablo, if we were going to do this in Spanish, Spanish is more synthetic than English. So the way in which you are going to embed context in Spanish, if we were going to do a large language model in Spanish will be different that the way we will do it in English. In English, everything is analytic. In Latin, everything is synthetic. In Spanish, it's a little bit in the middle. A couple of questions. Yeah. So um, one from me is, when, it, when you do the embedding of a word like bank that has many different meanings, mm -hmm. will it be converted into a little bit of weight put on each of the meanings or will it be treated as, oh, these are three different words and treated separately? No. So what we have done so far is just one word. Okay. The, the key now is exactly what I'm going to do now, which is the positional encoding. I'm going to say the same vector. I'm going to rotate it in a very particular way to capture the idea that sometimes it's a bench, sometimes it's a bank office. Okay. That's the encoding. But the embedding, I only do it once. I only do it bank and bank maps into something because otherwise this will get too complicated. Um, so I there's a couple more questions from the chat. Igor, do you want to ask your question? Yeah. Hi, I just want to check. Um, when you use embeddings uh, to figure out the next uh, vector, the next word, mm -hmm. uh, do you sum up? embeddings or do you use like should it be any metrics like a Euclidean distance between the vectors yeah okay so, so yeah so what you do here is you just sum and then when you look at the you get us an answer and then what you do is you look at the closest word within the embedding the closest token within the embedding and then you can define different different metrics okay so usually the closest one using some type of l2 norm works very well but I'm going to show you later that ChatGPT does something even a little bit more sophisticated. But at this moment, an L2 distance is all that you need. And um, Stephanie, you had a question too. Do you want to go ahead and ask it? Sure, thank you. Uh, I'm thinking about a simple task. So for example, when I'm working with proper names, like company names, and I want to merge some uh, databases that are some 
tasks that I have to take into account that it's different from this general framework? That's where you will need to have domain knowledge to have a specialized vocabulary. So you will need to have the standard. So you will take the standard vocabulary of the large language model and then add the extra tokens that you need on domain knowledge. And that's why doing this with an open source uh, a large language model like Llama will make your life much easier. There is ways to do this in ChatGPT, but it will require a little bit of effort. But this is exactly what domain knowledge is about. Okay. Okay. Now, as I was saying before, we need to figure, so bank, remember the embedding of bank is the same. The embedding of bank is this thing, whatever. Uh, let's suppose that this is the embedding of bank. So how are we going to tell that bank sometimes is a bench, sometimes is a noun, sometimes is a verb? Well, we are going to take the position of each token within the block. And remember in uh, ChatGPT, we are using uh, blocks of 2048. We start at zero, this is computer science. And we are going to, take that position and multiply, remember the dimensionality was 12,000 and change synodial functions at different frequencies. Mm. So we are going to say, imagine that the word bank appears in position five. So I'm going to look at this sign, this sign, this sign, and this sign. And I'm going to have in particular 12,288 synodial functions. And that's given me a lot of information about the fact that bank is one, two, three, four, five, the fifth token in my sentence. You may remember from Fourier analysis and time series econometrics that if I give you enough sines and cosines, I can replicate any signal. It doesn't even need to be a time series. It can be any signal in abstract. So that's what I'm doing. I'm getting all the information about where the word shows up in the sentence by having a bunch of signs and, and signs and cosines. Well, ChatGPT only uses signs. The original paper on attention uses both signs and cosines. And then I sum those signs to the matrix E that I got before. So remember, I got this embedding over here, E, which is 2048, the block and the dimensions. And I sum the signs, all the signs that I have applied, which are just the positions. And what I get is this matrix SE. And that matrix SE is the sum of the word bank and the encoding bank and of all the positions that bank has show up in this sentence. And in that way, I'm going to be able to capture both the word bank with all its possible meanings and that is going to have one different meaning depending on where it shows up in the sentence. And that's encoding, okay? And if you remember what I was telling you before is that it's encoding that the transformer model has two components. It has the encoder and the decoder, that's the encoding. And the encoding is just given the set information about where the word shows up in the sentence. And now we need to play attention. And the idea of attention is that we are going to tell ChatGPT that there are words that are much more important, that bank is much more important than the, and that I, I is much more important than in, that these are just words that we need because English is analytic. So how are we going to do this? We are going to use something called attention. Now, attention replicates a lot the way that human brains think. I don't have its time. There is a fantastic introduction on YouTube over here. It's a very nice video. It will explain attention in a lot of detail, but I want to skip it. Basically, the main point that you, win, you want to get from this is that you are going to use the neural network. And I know I'm going, now I'm going to skip details, okay? But, you know, I, I was thinking about this from the beginning. I knew that if I got to this point and I don't have many minutes left, it's okay, because these are just details. What I'm going to do is I'm going to have three new matrices, and I'm going to multiply, remember SE is this encoding that has both encoding of the word 
and the position in the world. And through deep neural networks, I'm going to find another three matrices, WQ, WK, and WV. And I'm going to play some operations on these matrices. And those are basically going to select the words in the sentence that are the most important and the words in the sentence that are the less important. And that's the way why different words are going to talk with each other. And that's how I'm going to be able to not only quote unquote understand, I'm a little bit reluctant to say the word understand, but you know, the neural network know both which words I'm dealing with, two, where they show up in the sentence, and three, to which position they need, I need to pay attention to. Now, there are some details about how you do this in practice. Now, some of you asked me before about time series and how we can enforce that this is a time filtration. Actually, ChatGPT and large language models usually enforce this through something called masking. And masking means I go back, it's a little bit like in time series, you cannot use future words to forecast the next ones. Uh, what is my example about the bank? So the idea is if I want to complete the word, I sit in the bank inside and I want to forecast the next word, I'm not going to use any of the tokens before, after inside. So I am forced, I'm only using quote unquote, the past of the information about how to do this. And that's called masking, which is basically you only use the previous tokens to forecast the current one. Well, anyway, then there is a lot of details about how you do this in practice uh, to do it and to train the network to, to do it very well. Now, uh, a lot of material I'm, I'm skipping. You probably want to see a little bit about how, oh, and once you are done, once you have had your final, you know, you have done all these weightings and you have forecasted the uh, next word, you can do it in two ways. You can either pick, this is called the top K probabilities. So you can either pick the most likely next word, or you can pick one randomly at, among the top K probabilities. For instance, among the top three more likely next words. And that's why sometimes these uh, large language models generate different output with the same prompt because you are doing this thing probabilistically. And the idea is you don't really quite replicate everything. You try to do this randomly. Anyway, I know I have a skip over a lot of the details. In particular, I'm not telling you the training. So remember, you have you need to train the param you need to train the embedding metrics and you need to train the attention matrices. Those are a bunch of parameters, those are very large dimensions. And that's why, you know, things like GPT-4 has one, how much we say, one billion parameters. Fantastically enough, we have code online to do this. So this one is a fantastic web page. Is the annotated transformer, is the original paper by Baswani, a group of researchers at Harvard actually went line by line over the code of how to implement it in PyTorch and in Python. And, you know, I was a little bit over ambitious. I was even thinking I will have 15, 20 minutes to go over the code. You know, if this was a 12 hours class, I will go over the code. It's super elegant. It's very easy. And what is really, you can see, for instance, the masking graph, I took it from there. What is really amazing is that thanks to the use of PyTorch, this whole code, you know, I, I hope that you can see that I'm not scrolling that much down. Most of it is just a, is just a graphs. The whole code that implements a large language model is actually a surprisingly short code. And all that is because we are going to use PyTorch. Okay. And that's really the key. And that's why people love this type of things. This we can really code a large language model with very little effort. Now, will not be a large language model that we can release to the public and people can ask all sorts of random questions. But if we want to take a large language model and apply it to something specialized in economics, the code is going to be in the hundreds of lines 
not in the thousands or ten thousands of lines. Okay, so that's an amazing thing. This is a really very simple code. And also, uh, remember I was telling you before about this chap, uh, Andrew Karpathy. He actually has this fantastic video. He will actually go line by line on the code. This is more of a computer science video, but he will really tell you all the details of how to build a large language model line by line in the code. So if you want to learn code, this is a fantastic source. And also he has a GitHub repo where you will be able to get the code and he will give you a bunch of stuff. I, at the end, is 11.58, so I really want to uh, finish in time. I only want to point out that you really want to run all this in GPUs. If you try to run it on your computer, on your, on your regular CPU, this will be way too slow. Good thing about GPUs, you have them at Amazon Web Services. So you can flash all this to any type of cloud service and do it very efficiently. And then in all the other slides, I have, I have a skip. Those are, I guess, the director's cut of my presentation. Uh, they have a lot of details, but hopefully once you have, you know, watched these three hours, you can have an idea of what the details are about. And if you have questions, you want to learn more, send me an email and I will try my best to answer the questions that my knowledge allows me to answer. But it's 11.59 and let me stop here in case we still have a couple of questions. Yeah, we, we have time for, for one or two questions. If somebody wants to jump in, just go ahead and mute yourself and, and, and go ahead. I briefly asked this in chat, but um, what would be an example of a bad research um, paper that you've seen in the past? Thank you. Okay, so I, I'm not going to name names. I think that's not very nice. Um, but I, what I often see are papers that just take some machine learning library and they take some data set and they apply it in a little bit of a, you know, there's not a lot of insights. There is not a lot of intuition. There is not a lot of economics. It's just, oh, I learned to use PyTorch. Let me apply this to some standard thing. So I don't think about artificial intelligence or deep learning or large language models as a substitute for anything in economics. And think of, I, I think about them as, a, as an addition, as a new tool. And if, if what you are going to do is just use large language models to do what we already knew how to do, or just to kind of in a very brainless uh, way to mindless way to, to do a stuff that is not that interesting, that will be the, po the, the point. Look, at the, end we are, at the end of the day, we are economists. I know that today, probably over the last three hours, I have not sound a lot like an economist, but at the end of the day, I'm an economist. Okay, I really care about inflation. I care about unemployment. I care about you know why Spain doesn't grow faster than it does. That's that's what really motivates me. Okay, that's what keeps me wake up at night. Why is Spain stuck? Uh, uh, why has Spain stagnated? I want to use deep learning and large language models to understand that. If your paper at the end of the day doesn't have a substantive, meaningful economic question is not a paper that is going to be very successful in the profession because it will be a paper in computer science. It will not be a paper in economics. And I'm not claiming I'm able to do it all the times. You know, I guess that many of my papers are boring or don't have great answers to, to very interesting questions, but at least that's what you need to try. You need to aim, at the end of the day, you need to ask yourself, is this an important economic question? And is deep learning and a large language models the right way to answer? Thank you. All right. On, on that note, um, we're going to end this for today. I want to thank Jesus very, very much for, for volunteering to for this lecture. And I, I hope to see you all tomorrow. Um, we're going to have Carolyn Fluger talking about um, monetary policy and asset prices. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Awesome as usual. Thank you. See you tomorrow, everyone.